Thank you, Kelly, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody who's listening, and welcome to my small workshop regarding spread spectrum techniques and how to reduce effectively EMI with that. So here's my small agenda for my session for today. So first of all, we're going to have a quick look into the spect spectrum of a traditional switch mode power supply. So this is really, really rough and short, um, out of the box thinking, how does a switch mode power supply spectrum will look like? After this, we'll jump in the theory of um, frequency spread spectrum. Um, and then if the theory is done, we're gonna sh I'm gonna show you some practical measurements um, on real boards and how these practical measurements will also be shown on the EMI receiver. After that, I'm going to have a quick look into the limitation of frequency spe spectrum because nothing is for free. So everything which has a benefit will also have a limitation. After that, I'm going to conclude it. And then if we still have time left, we continue to our question and answer session. So just up front, whenever during my session, I will talk about frequency spread spectrum, I will sometimes use the phrase FSS. It's just frequency spread spectrum, and this makes just life easier for me to explain something to you, as well as as I'm talking about switch mode power supplies, I'm sometimes we'll use the phrase SMPS. So everywhere where we have switch mode power supply, SMPS is the phrase of frequency spread spectrum, FSS is the phrase. So before jumping into the theory, short outlook, who I am, who your presenter is today. So as I already said, my name is Florian. I'm 30 years old and I live in a very, very small village inside the middle of nowhere in the middle of Germany. So I just put in red arrow where I live. So there's no big town nearby. So I can tell you I live nearby Munich or Berlin, for example, just put the red arrow here. So this is where I live. I'm married, I'm a field applications engineer at MPS, and I have one so son and one small Dalmatian dog you can see here. But now let's jump into the session why we are here. So first of all, let's check how a spectrum of a traditional switch mode power supply will look like. To show it to you, I did the following experiment. So I took an evaluation board of a standard off battery buck controller, the EVQ4430. This is just a three amp buck controller. You can directly connect it to a car battery and the output voltage is yeah something between the input voltage and down to one volt with a maximum output current of three and a half amps. To show you the spectrum of the switch mode power supply, I just connected, maybe you can see it here, a small pin to the switch node. So actually I connected it to the inductor, which is connected to the switch node to record directly the switch node with an oscilloscope. To show you the different influences, I added a trim frequency potentiometer you can see here. And this is just the potentiometer, which is connected between the frequency pin and ground. And on that table, you will see using a 250 kilo ohm um, potentiometer allows me to trim the frequency of that SMPS between 350 kilohertz up to two and a half megahertz. I added a second potentiometer, which makes me able to trim the duty cycle. And as a SMPS, in general, is not able to trim the duty cycle. I just used a small trick. So I used this potentiometer to replace the bottom resistor of the feedback network. So at the end, when I'm uh, trimming the duty cycle, I just change the output voltage. And looking into that table here, I replaced resistor eight with a 20 kilo ohm potentiometer, which allows me to change the output voltage between two and a half volts up to 12 volts. So this was my measurement setup, really basic measurement setup. I used my computer to do some recording. I used the Roden Schwarz MXO series to do a real-time FFT measurement on the switch node. Here is a laboratory power supply and here's our MPS efficiency meter, which I just used to, um, to have a load on the SMPS. 
So first of all, looking into the um, really basic spectrum of the SMPS. So my operating point was easy. It was 13 and a half volts input voltage, five volts output voltage. Switching frequency was 500 kilohertz, output voltage one amp. So this makes our mode in the continuous conduction mode. And the resolution bandwidth of my FFT was nine kilohertz. And this is the result. So on the top, you see the switch node with the duty cycle corresponding to V in and V out. And on the bottom, you will see the real time FFT the oscilloscope did for me on the switch node. And what we can see, we see the switching frequency, we see all the harmonics, the 10th, the 20s, the 30s, all the harmonics. So up to 30 megahertz. After this, I increased my um, frequency span up to 300 megahertz, as you can see here. And what you can see is that the spectral power of the switch node will decrease with the frequency. Here at higher frequencies, you can see the noise floor of the oscilloscope. In fact, this picture looks the same for every SMPS you will measure. The only difference is the area where will you reach the noise floor. So in general, the spectral power will decrease over the frequency and will reach the noise floor something between 300 megahertz and 700 megahertz, always depending on your switching frequency and on the EMI design of your IC itself. So now in the second stage, let's explore what the different parameters will do to our spectrum. Therefore, I change the input voltage, I change the duty cycle, and I change the switching frequency. And here I have provided some small videos for you. So on this video, what you can see is here, it's the switch node again on the top, and on the bottom side, there is the spectrum. I just draw that blue line in here, so you have a reference. I was starting with an input voltage of 13.5 volt, which you can see here on the bottom. And here the switch node you will see will change the duty cycle by increasing the input voltage. And now you can see what's happening to the spectrum. So here on the bottom at the blue arrow, you will see I'm increasing the input voltage. On the top at the blue arrow, you can see the duty cycle is changing as well as the input voltage is changing. And what you can see in the spectrum is that this effective EMI, so each peak of this spectrum will be increased. And the reason why this is, is because we are measuring the emissions on the switch node and the input voltage is directly linked to the hot loop of the buck SMPS. This means here effectively the switching flanks are higher because now we are switching between, for example, zero and 27 volts, instead of switching between zero and 13 volts, which leads to an increase of the EMI. In the next step, I change the duty cycle, which just means that I change the DC output voltage of the um, SMPS. And here we need to take care what happens at these specific harmonics. So I will try to stop the video. So in fact, what you can see here, changing the duty cycle on the bottom with the blue arrow, you can see increasing the duty cycle will not affect the spectrum at all. However, there is one specific phenomenon and I'm gonna show it to you now. This is exactly at 50% duty cycle. You can see that all even harmonics will disappear where the odd harmonics will still remain the same. This is really specific for 50% duty cycle and really, really specific for this one operating point. If I'm continuing the video now, you will see that already for 51 or 52% of duty cycle, the even harmonics will be back in the spectrum, as you can see here. So at the end, I said I changed the switching frequency of the SMPS. Um, problem here is when I touched the potentiometer on the frequency pin, you will see that I added some noise to my spectrum. So in this video, we should maybe focus on the first few harmonics here on the bottom left side. I again started at 500 kilohertz and increased the switching frequency up to two megahertz. 
And what happens, you can see here. Here you can see the noise, which I just injected during myself, during my body, touching the frequency pin. However, I increase the switching frequency and all these peaks will move farther away from each other. What you can also see in this video is that each specific peak itself will remain the same in height. But that's just the look like an electrical engineer, I would say, will look to these peaks. However, if an EMC engineer will look to that video, um, he will look different to that because in an EMC world, we are not looking at spikes. No EMC engineer in the world is saying, hey, the second or the third or the fifth harmonic has this value. No, an EMC engineer will focus on a frequency, on a frequency in the spectrum. And for example, just going to take the pen. He's looking at, yeah, um, 4.5 um, megahertz of switching frequency. And as you can see, starting again from 500 kilohertz, just looking at that frequency, I would say that our spectral power at 4.5 megahertz is something around 8 dB. Now, when I increase the switching frequency, just will increase the video to the 2 megahertz and try to stop it, you will see when the EMC engineer will look at exactly the same frequency, he will now see that the emissions at that frequency, I would say, is round about at 20 dB. And so this is the two different looks. So each specific peak will remain the same in height. However, if you look at the exact same frequency, your spectral power of the switch node will be increased. You will see that, just need to erase all ink, again on the next page. So here I draw a line. This is my bottom line for an EMC engineer. This is the spectral power of my SMPS. And now I'm going to change again my switching frequency beginning at 500 kilohertz. I will change it to 2 megahertz. And you will see that the spectrum of this will be increased. So we will be way above the blue line in the whole frequency area. So just need to check. OK, now the video is finished. And now what you can see is that we are above the line, checking the left side again, round about 12 dB. So why is this the case? It's easy. Uh, increase of the frequency. So let's say, for example, here, we double the frequency from 500 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. This means we have twice as much switching flanks. Let's just imagine we are having the green frame now. This means at 500 kilohertz, we have two switching flanks in this green flame. Uh, frame. So doubling the frequency to one megahertz means we have twice as much switching flanks in this green flame. frame. As you can see, we have four switching flanks. However, the energy of these switching flanks will be transferred to only half of the peaks during the FFT in the frequency area. And this means doubling the frequency will increase your spectrum of your SMPS by 6 dB. And this is exactly what we saw in the video before. I changed the switching frequency from 500 kilohertz to 2 megahertz. This means two times doubling of the frequency. And this was exactly that 12 dB more in the spectrum. So what's now the theory behind frequency spread spectrum? So this is exactly the technique we want to use now to reduce that spectrum. First of all, to understand how frequency spread spectrum works, we have to look at a block diagram of a really, really old EMI measurement receiver. There on the left side, we have the antenna, we have the pre-selector, first mixer, filter, second mixer, filter, demodulation, and the display. The thing is, the second filter here this is the resolution bandwidth filter. After the resolution bandwidth filter, the demodulator will create a power 
out of our signal. And this power will be directly displayed at your display, which you can see. So this means after the demodulator, because then our signal was transferred to a power, we have no chance to influence um, our spectrum anymore. However, the first mixer most of the time defines my frequency span, which is predefined. So the only possibility to reduce the spectrum by not reducing the spectrum of the SMPS, but of the measurement, is to adapt the resolution bandwidth filter. And the resolution bandwidth filter is given by the bandwidth. The bandwidth is given by the lower band edge and the upper band edge, which is defined by the minus 3 dB, as well as the filter order. And there, checking um, EMC standards, most of the time in the, as an EMC engineer, you will have three resolution bandwidths. This means most of the time it's nine kilohertz for frequency ranges up to 30 megahertz. The resolution bandwidth is most of the time 120 kilohertz for the mid frequency ranges between 30 megahertz and one gigahertz. And above one gigahertz, most of the time, the resolution bandwidth can go up to one megahertz. And what this EMI receiver does, if we take a really, really old school EMI receiver, no fancy FFT receivers, is the FFT receiver, the measurement receiver will just sweep through the predefined frequency span and wherever the switching frequency will create a peak into that spectrum, the display of your measurement receiver will directly show this peak surrounded by the resolution bandwidth. And this will exactly look like this. So we have a switching frequency with all the harmonics. And with the resolution bandwidth we have here, it's displayed on your display of your measurement receiver. This does also mean if you increase your resolution bandwidth, the gaps between your switching frequency will become smaller and the display will show a broader area which directly defines the resolution bandwidth filter. And here, this is what you can see in green, so in between of these peaks, this is empty area. And this area, this is exactly what we want to use to hide the energy of these peaks or at the end to reduce the size of this peak. But the only way to do this, we need to move energy from this peak inside this resolution bandwidth filter into the green area. And what you can also see is that with a higher resolution bandwidth, the green area in between these peaks will become smaller. This means the possibility we have to reduce the EMI is smaller with a higher resolution bandwidth. In the next step, I also considered the switching frequency of the SMPS. So if you have a really slow switching frequency with your SMPS, you will see that your harmonics are much nearer together than with a higher switching frequency. This will also effectively reduce the green area, which reduces the possibility of hiding energy into that area. So in theory, the best way we can, what we can do, and this would probably be the best way to have a frequency spread spectrum, is to move all of the energy we have in these peaks into the green area, which will result in a perfect white noise. So even if that is impossible to move the energy to a perfect white noise, even this is limited. Um, so if we would be able to move all the energy from these areas, which is inside the resolution bandwidth filter to the green area that we have a perfectly flat spectrum, our absolute maximum attenuation, which is possible using spread spectrum is given by 10 times the logarithmus of the resolution bandwidth divided by the switching frequency. And this is something you can see here on the right table. You can see that if the switching frequency of your SMPS is smaller than your resolution bandwidth, your attenuation will be zero for sure, because your resolution bandwidth here, this means the blue area. If this is bigger and the peaks are together, you will have zero attenuation. 
In the same time, going back to my example from the beginning, if we take a 500 kilohertz switching SMPS with a nine kilohertz um, resolution bandwidth, the maximum attenuation we can achieve is 17.4 dB. If you go to higher frequency areas and increase the resolution bandwidth to 120 kilohertz, your effective attenuation, which you maximum can achieve is six to two dBs. So, but how to convert now these peaks to a perfect white noise, or at least into a frequency spread spectrum signal, because to transfer it to a perfect white noise is slightly impossible. The answer is easy. To convert this peak to a frequency spread spectrum signal, we need to dither with the frequency around the frequency, around the center frequency. So this means for SMPS, it's easy. We have a switching frequency, and this switching frequency needs to move around the center frequency. For example, if we have here our example again from the beginning, if we have 500 kilohertz here, we need to move with the switching frequency, for example, between 400 and 600 kilohertz. But how does this dithering affect our original or our spectrum? To explain that, I'm gonna show two cases. So let's begin with the first case on the left side here. So for example, this case is FSS is too slow. So you can see it here. This is our fundamental frequency and this moves very, very slow within this bandwidth. The problem is the EMI measurement receiver has a settling time. So if this error moves too slow, this means if it stays inside this bandwidth longer than the settling time of the filter, our effective attenuation with frequency spread spectrum will be zero. The second case is our amplitude is too small. This is exactly what I described before. So if my center frequency and the movement around the center frequency is too small, and we will stay all the time inside this resolution bandwidth filter, also the effective attenuation will be zero. Even if we move fast, we will never reach the edge of the filter. We will always stay inside and the EMI measurement receiver will show us the full value of the peaks. So first of all, let's once again go back to the case one. So I told you we have a settling time. So this settling time of this resolution bandwidth filter, it's physically given. So the settling time of a, of a bandpass filter is one divided by the resolution bandwidth. This means we have to move through the, res through the resolution bandwidth faster than the settling time. Now let's take back our three filters again for a nine kilohertz filter. The settling time is 111 microseconds. This means if this little error moves from the lower to the upper band edge, it must be faster than 111 microseconds. So, which is quite fair. The problem you will see here. So if you have a resolution bandwidth, for example, with 120 kilohertz, the settling time is eight microseconds. So now we have to move from the lower band edge to the upper band edge within eight microseconds. The problem is it's not just the reduced time, also the bandwidth was increased. And if we have a resolution bandwidth of one megahertz, we have to move through an area which is one megahertz big faster than a microsecond, which can be really tough in regards of a hardware design. So this means for us to have an effective attenuation on this frequency spread spectrum, our frequency change must be faster than the resolution bandwidth of the filter by square. So looking back to the picture, if we have a nine kilohertz resolution bandwidth in our EMI receiver, we need to move through that nine kilohertz bandwidth in 111 microseconds. This is quite fair. This makes us to a change of the frequency of 81 megahertz per second. I tried to show you how fast we already need to be if we have a 120 kilohertz bandwidth, because the area from the lower to the upper bandwidth is more than 10 times higher and the time is more than 10 times slower. We need to move a lot of faster 
through this bandwidth to have an effective attenuation, which leads to 14 gigahertz per second already. And for the one megahertz resolution bandwidth, I did not even try to make a GIF because uh, my, my desktop was too small, but this would result into one terahertz per second of frequency change. And what do we do if we change the frequency around its original frequency? At the end, it's just frequency modulation what we do. So now we should let the power designers pass by and think with the brain of a communications electronical designer. So now we have a frequency modulation. A frequency modulation is generally given by two values. The first is the modulation frequency. And the modulation frequency is just the frequency how often we move through that um, band pass within one second. So if I'm gonna let the arrow move again, the modulation frequency, if we would count how often this arrow would move through that band pass filter, Within one second, this is exactly our modulation frequency. And the second, how to define a frequency modulation is the modulation depth. And the modulation depth is just the minimum frequency that arrow will reach here and the maximum frequency, which the arrow will reach here. So it's the delta frequency, which is given by the maximum minus the minimum frequency. And having that modulation frequency as well as the modulation depth we can create a modulation index. And the modulation index is just given by the modulation depth divided by the modulation frequency. So at the end, the modulation index will just describe the spread of the frequency. So the maximum divided by the minimum frequency. So the frequency this error will pass divided by how often it goes through that within one second. Why I'm gonna tell you that is because if we have the modulation frequent, if we have the modulation index, it is easy to see how we can reduce our um, peaks in the spectrum by using the Bessel functions of the first kind. Here on that graph on the right, you can see that in the uh, black line, we have our fundamental frequency and all the other lines are the sidebands. This means if we have deactivated our spread spectrum, this means our modulation index will be zero. And all the power of this peak is in its original peak. This means the zero sideband, this means the original carrier frequency is here with the value of one. If we now activate our spread spectrum, this means our modulation index will be greater than one you will see that power from this black line is transferred to all the sidebands. For example, to the first sideband in the red, to the second in the yellow, to the third in the green, and so on. And the higher this modulation frequency will become, you will see the smaller all these Bessel functions will become. So in general, we can see that the higher the modulation index will become, the smaller the peaks of our spread spectrum will become. What we can also see is that there are some modulation index, for example, 2.4 or 5.6, where the fundamental frequency will be zero. This means that our carrier frequency in this specific operating point will be zero and all the power will be transferred to the sidebands. So now, as I said, the modulation index, as bigger this will become, as more attenuation will get. We get. Um, why just don't we make this modulation index going to infinity? Because we have two limitations, two physical limitations. The first thing to make the modulation index big is to make the delta frequency big. The problem is we can't go to infinity because imagine a 500 kilohertz switching SMPS, you cannot change the, uh, the frequency by two megahertz. Because if you have 500 kilohertz moving around by two megahertz, you would, this would result in negative frequencies, which is just impossible. And the other thing is 
we should we could decrease the modulation frequency. This means if we move slower, means less often through the middle of this bandpass filter, this will increase our modulation index. However, the physical limitation is here. If this modulation frequency will become too small, then we are violating the settling time criteria of the bandwidth filter. So this means if we move, move too slow, we will stay too long inside the bandwidth filter, and then the, our attenuation will also become zero. And this is most of the time the problem every bad spectrum has, that you need to find really the sweet spot of your modulation index. However, it has also something good. So the thing is, if we adapt frequency spread spectrum, for example, again to a switching frequency, we will always adapt this to the switching frequency. This means to the original switching frequency. So let's take this example. We have a frequency modulation of 10 kilohertz and a modulation depth of 10 kilohertz. This modulation depth will be injected to the fundamental frequency of our SMPS. And this results in the fact that for each harmonic, the modulation depth will be twice as high, three times as high, x times as high, which you can see in that GIF. Because if I move the fundamental frequency, for example, from 400 to 600 kilohertz, my second harmonic will automatically move from 800 kilohertz to 1 or 2 megahertz. So this means the modulation depth will become high for high harmonics. And this will automatically have a high modulation index, which is good for us, which makes our frequency spread spectrum very effective for higher harmonics. Now we have, now as we know, um, how and how fast to move this error, we need to know um, the waveform because um, we now know that we have to move through this bandwidth filter really fast. And we know that we have to move far away from the edges of the bandwidth filter to achieve a good attenuation. However, we still don't know the waveform how to move around. And therefore, I would introduce you some waveforms. So in theory, the best thing is if we move through that frequency span with a constant frequency change. So this can, for example, be done with a triangular waveform. You can see here on the left side, we have our minimum frequency and we have our maximum frequency. This means this is our modulation depth. And here we have our frequency of this triangular waveform, which is then nothing else than our modulation frequency. The problem you can see here, if you use a triangular waveform to implement your frequency spread spectrum to your SMPS, you will have a delta frequency, so a change in the frequency within a specific time during the slope. However, if you're on the edge of this slope, this frequency change will only be half during that time. And this makes the triangular waveform suboptimal for, um, for uh, attenuation on the edges. If you want to have a constant frequency change over time, for example, then you can imagine having a sawtooth ramp form. As you can see, during the rising slope, at each slope, we will have a constant frequency change within a specific amount of time. And then if we are on the top edge, we will directly jump to the bottom edge. So this means we will directly jump from the maximum to the minimum frequency within one switching cycle and then repeat the same again. The problem is this huge change of the frequency here, it nearly goes to infinity. Looking into it as an SMPS designer means this frequency change will happen within one switching cycle. And this can lead to big problems of your SMPS control loop. Considering this, there are uh, mixing products, for example, the Hershey Kiss, where the slope at the edges is much sharper than 
during the middle edge, or you have a step triangular waveform where the frequency change here is much smaller. So from a stability point of view at your SMPS, it's much easier to deal with that. And in addition to that, in new SMPS generations, like for example, the MPQ4371, there's also the possibility that we can adapt a dual frequency spread spectrum. And what this means, you can see here on the bottom side, I have recorded the waveform in blue of the spread spectrum. And what you can see here, it's a triangular waveform with a 15 kilohertz. And on top of that, there's an additional 120 kilohertz modulation. So with these parts, we can add two modulation frequencies into the spread spectrum modulation. So why do we need to do this? This is something we can find out here. So I did some practical measurements with the frequency spread spectrum on an each on a real SMPS. So what I did now, I once again took my carrier frequency with 500 kilohertz and my frequency span was 20% of this 500 kilohertz, which is as a rule of thumb, a quite good value if you start developing and um, using spread spectrum. This will result in a frequency hub of 100 kilohertz. This means I'm changing my frequency my fundamental frequency between 450 and 550 kilohertz. Now what I did in this video, we will watch the video soon, is I'm sweeping the modulation frequency from 120 kilohertz to two kilohertz with a triangular waveform. When I now start the video, you can watch here to the spectrum. So here in yellow, you can see my uh, 500 kilohertz switching frequency displayed with the resolution bandwidth of the filter I used. Here on the top, in the pink line, you will see my um, spread spectrum signal where you have on the x-axis the modulation frequency and on the y-axis your uh, the modulation depth. Now, if I start a video, you will see that at the beginning, as soon as I start spread spectrum, I will directly have an influence of my spectrum. So you can see here, I'm moving energy from this peak to the sidebands. This is exactly what we are doing. So here we have now our fundamental frequency in the middle. Here we have the sidebands. And here, this is my, um, my spread spectrum with 120 kilohertz. Continuing to watch the video, I will decrease the modulation frequency which automatically results in a rise of the modulation depth here. You can see it here. So what we are doing, gonna pause the video once again. If you're looking at the modulation index, your delta F here is increased. However, your FM, your modulation frequency is also decreased. So in fact, the modulation index should slightly be all the time the same. It's not fully linear, so it's slightly moving, but it's most of the time in the same area. However, you will see here in the spectrum that there is a sweet spot where we can achieve up to 10 dB of attenuation. And by the rule of thumb, you can say the best attenuation you can achieve with spread spectrum is when your modulation frequency is absolutely equal to your resolution bandwidth filter. And this is the case now. So I finished the video here. So I ended with a modulation frequency of nine kilohertz with a resolution bandwidth of nine kilohertz, which you can see here. And I achieved the attenuation of around about 10 dB. So how does this affect my whole spectrum? You can see here. So starting again, same conditions. I just increased my frequency span here up to 30 megahertz. And as you can see, as soon as I will start the spread spectrum, which I'm doing now, you will see that I directly get an attenuation. So here, looking the pink line again, high modulation frequency, I still get some sort of modulation. 
What we can also see here for the fundamental frequency on the left for the first, second, and third harmonics, my attenuation is very low because my modulation index is very low. For higher frequencies, the attenuation is better because we automatically get a good modulation index for higher frequencies. And now to show that the attenuation is best when the modulation frequency is close to the resolution bandwidth, I'm going to continue decreasing my modulation frequency and you will see that I will achieve more and more attenuation in the full frequency band. This is again here, I'm going to pause here. This is the sweet spot. This is the maximum attenuation we are possible to get with this um, settings here on the top. So, but this was now at the moment just a practical measurement with the scope. How does this influence my EMI receiver? So, these are measurements taken inside the, our MPS EMC chamber with our M. Rodenschwarz measurement receiver. So, we just did the same exercise again. My carrier frequency was once again 500 kilohertz. My modulation depth was once again 100 kilohertz. Modulation waveform was triangle. And now I started with a modulation frequency of 9 kilohertz. And the resolution bandwidth filter you can see here was also 9 kilohertz. On the left picture, you can see the spectrum of my SMPS without, and on the right side, with FSS. And then I just put some markers here. So the first marker and the second marker, you will see that I get the attenuation from the left to the right side of about 10 to 20 dB. Now on the next slide, I just did the same exercise again with a higher frequency band. I once again used a modulation frequency of nine kilohertz, but in this frequency band, my resolution bandwidth was 100 kilohertz. So you see, I'm still getting an attenuation of five to 10 dBs, but I'm out of that sweet spot where my modulation frequency is slightly the same as my resolution bandwidth. So I increased my modulation frequency once again and took the same picture. And as you can see, now I can get, have an attenuation of 10 up to 20 dBs. So this means, I'm just jumping back and we are just looking at these numbers here on the bottom right side. We have with a nine kilohertz modulation frequency minus 77 dBm. And if I just change the modulation frequency to 120 kilohertz, we have minus 80 dBm. This means by just changing the modulation frequency, I gained three dB of EMI emissions. And that's why we implement in our future products, always the dual spread spectrum with the 15 kilohertz and the 200, 120 kilohertz. So we will be able to support the best possible attenuation in each frequency band. And this is what you can exactly see on this scope. So here in green, we see that evaluation board without spread spectrum. In blue, it's a dual spread spectrum with 10% of span. And in orange, we can see the dual spread spectrum with 15 kilohertz and 120 kilohertz. You can see for sure in the low frequency area, the single spread spectrum works better. And why does it work better? Because simply the span is, is bigger. This means just through that span, we have a bigger modulation index, which leads to better EMI performance. However, you will see that even the dual spread spectrum will have an attenuation greater than 10 dB at each spike. But now if you, we look at a broader frequency area, especially now checking the radio band, the FM radio band, we see that the dual spread spectrum will gain us about three to four dB more attenuation in that frequency band, just by having this 120 kilohertz frequency spread spectrum part. So now let's just quickly jump into the limitations of spread spectrum. So, because now we say everything is fine with spread spectrum. No, it isn't, because you know, need to do what, you need to know what frequency spread spectrum does. Because it's exactly that. We do not damp 
each peak, we just move the energy from each peak of the SMPS to the area between the resolution bandwidth filters. And this is what happens to a specific frequency band. Here, I just took an FM radio tuner. You want to listen to a FM radio frequency, yeah, something maybe 102 megahertz. And here on the left side, I don't have spread spectrum active. This means my harmonics are outside of my radio band. I can listen to radio, everything is fine. When I turn the modulation on, I take the energy of these peaks and move it to the red area, which means I don't have any radio anymore because my noise will be higher. So no chance to have the radio anymore. And the second limitation, spread spectrum will always add a ripple to the output voltage. This means here, I took an evaluation board and measured the output voltage ripple in correlation with my frequency spread spectrum. As you can see, the spread spectrum was always the same and the output voltage ripple can be tuned by tuning the inductor and the output capacitor values. However, even with the absolute optimum setting, which we can achieve, it's not possible to make the spread spectrum fully flat on the output line. You will always have an influence on your output voltage. So at the end of my workshop, I'm going to tell you how to implement frequency spread spectrum, because now we know everything about spread spectrum. We know the, the benefits, we know the limitation, but how to use it as an electrical engineer. The first and easiest thing is you just buy an SMPS that has spread spectrum already implemented. For example, 4320, 4340 series. New series from MPS also allows you the possibility to play around with the modulation depth as well as the modulation frequencies. So in new generations of SMPS, you will be able to select the most fitting spread spectrum for your purpose. However, Sometimes you have an SMPS already in your design and you are close to going to serious production and now you're just failing the EMC. And now it's not possible maybe to change the SMPS anymore or there's just no time. And now I'm gonna show you a small trick how to add frequency spread spectrum to every SMPS which has a frequency pin. I took again the 4430. So the 4430 is a buck converter which has a frequency pin as you can see here. So if you have a buck converter with a frequency pin, you just have to measure the voltage on that frequency pin during normal operation, which is in my case, 480 millivolt. And to that frequency pin, I want to have a modulation depth of 20%, which will result in a voltage change on the frequency pin of plus minus 60 millivolts. So what I did, I used the timer IC and implemented a pulse width modulation onto that frequency pin, which shifts my frequency voltage from 480 millivolts plus minus 60 millivolts. And how to do that? It's easy. First of all, you have your timer IC with your output. You have a DC blocking cap, and then you have a resistor, and then you have a second resistor with a um, capacitor. So now how to calculate this? As a rule of thumb, you have two possibilities. The first is, Looking at that network, the first assumption is the resistance of your capacitor is way much lower than the resistor of R2. So all the current will flow into that capacitor. So having a given value of R2 and my modulation frequency, as well as my delta voltage I want to achieve, I can just quickly calculate my resistance of the capacitor, which gives me a capacitor value of around about 170 nanofarad. So I select 100 nanofarad. So the second assumption I'm doing is that the first resistor, resistor one, is way much bigger than these two resistors. So this defines the main current going into the circuit. And doing this math, I calculated Resistor one is around about 11 kilohertz, so I selected 10 kilohertz. And what I did here now is to take the measurement with exactly that values. I took 10 kilohertz here, one kilohertz here, 100 nanofarad here. And what you can see is on exactly that point, beginning of the filter, I have my perfect PWM from my timer IC. And here, this is my voltage I'm adding to that frequency pin. And this will exactly result in the split spectrum 
in a triangular waveform of the spread spectrum I have told you above. So at the end, to conclude, frequency spread spectrum does have many benefits and can effectively hide EMI emissions of your design in unused areas. Please be aware that FSS can only hide EMC and not reduce the effective EMC. So this means we always take power from the peaks and hide it in the area in between. We will not um, decrease the overall power, which is um, yeah, which is emitted from our um, from our SMPS. FSS cannot truly reduce EMI emissions of the design. We just move it into the neighborhood where we just reduce the peaks and move the energy to other frequency areas. Please be careful when using frequency spread spectrum in a specific frequency area. In example, the radio band, because you will have maybe other frequency bands you are now blocking with the energy you move from the peaks away. And depending on the values of your external components, for example, the inductor or the output capacitor, you may add a huge voltage ripple on your output. And now I'm coming to the end of my presentation and starting with the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Florian. Lots of good info today. Uh, just um, to let everyone know, there have been questions we are recording the session and we do have the um, presentation will be available. We will email that out to you all uh, by the end of the week. And um, you can always look for our past efforts at monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars. We did go a little long on that one. So we have five minutes and we're gonna start promptly with our next one in five minutes, but we do have a bunch of questions. Um, so we're just gonna try and dive into them. If we don't get through them all, um, maybe we'll send out an email or something with the remaining questions. Uh, the first one, I don't know if this one was really about the presentation, but what's a good cheap probe to use with the tiny SA to find RFI? Oh, um, a cheap probe to find RFI, it's it's easy. It's not part of that um, webinar. You can look into our old webinars. One of our first webinars we did from MPS was exactly that. And there the engineer just used an MLCC output cap, which was soldered to a BCI cable. So just check our webinar for the first EMI webinars. There we will find it there. You will see how to use it and how to use an MLCC with a specific size on a BNC cable to look for EMI. Next up, when I enable spread spectrum on my PMIC, I start seeing tones on my sampled signals through the mixer circuit. How do I solve this issue? Um. This is a really good question. I'm not 100% sure if I got it right. If you say you receive a tone, if you mean a tone with an audible noise, you can just increase your modulation frequency. And that's mainly the reason we from MPS use slightly higher modulation frequencies than the resolution bandwidth to do not have an audible noise on our SMPSs. So um, if you have an audible noise, most of the time your modulation frequency is too low. So you have that huge output ripple on your V outline, which will result in your MLCCs creating a tone. Um, if you mean a tone like uh, distortion, that's what I mentioned. You can fine tune your um, network consisting of the inductor and your MLCCs, more MLCCs, smaller inductor will result in less output ripple, which will help even with an audible noise or with distortions on the output. Great. Next up, what is the influence of the GND cable on the oscilloscope probe? Shouldn't this be as short as possible? Um, absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think you are referring to my picture from the beginning. I just took this one because I measured very, very low frequencies with the frequency area to 30 megahertz. And I directly measured the switch node. So the um, voltage on my probe was plus mine was plus the input voltage to zero, so 13 volts. And in that case, the distortion through the ground line was minor. So 
in fact, if I would want to measure it very correctly, the ground loop of the oscilloscope probe should be as small as possible. That's correct. And then another oscilloscope. Uh, using a ground spring on the oscilloscope probe would reduce the parasitic inductance and probably increase the measurement accuracy. That's exactly what I mentioned. So this is the best way to measure this. As I mentioned, I put this small pin to the switch node. So I measure the switch node directly with my video. So I did not measure the real EMI output. So I measure the switch node. So the EMI emissions of the full switch node. So therefore the ground um, did not play the huge role. In this case, if you really want to measure the emissions of the IC, the ground plays a huge role. And therefore, you should try to increase the loop with the um, ground spring to a minimum. Sometimes even this ground spring loop is too big. And then you have to use something else like active probes. Uh, next, what is the significance of different resolution bandwidth for different frequency range? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? What is the significance of different resolution bandwidths for different frequency range? Oh, um, I just took that out of the standards. So I'm not an expert when it comes to standards, but most of the time the standards will refer to this resolution bandwidth for this frequency area. In fact, at a measurement receiver, you can use any resolution bandwidth with any frequency area. I just use the most popular ones from the standard. Great. Thanks. And then I apologize to everyone else who's asked <laughs> questions, but... Um... I do want to keep us on schedule. I think, uh, Florian, I think we're going to have to, all, all these questions are re are recorded. So maybe we can send out an email with uh, that we can help try and address exactly. all these good questions that everyone had. But um, uh, exactly. Alexander, if you can go ahead and, and start to share your presentation, we will make the transition to uh, our next presentation. Um, so I'd like to welcome Alexander uh, Kulmer from Roden Schwartz, who's going to cover measurement fundamentals of AC, DC, SMS, and P's. Um, so again, uh, a little bit of our housekeeping for those who, who showed up late. Yes, we're recording everything, and they'll be available to you by the end of the week. Um, questions we'll get back to you with. And with that, I will turn it over to Alexander. Thank you so much. So I hope you can hear me properly. Yes, you sound good. Everything looks, okay. I, I see your screen good and you sound good. So I think we can just Perfect. go ahead and jump in. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar again and talk a little bit about measurement fundamentals of ACDC switchboard power supplies. This presentation was initially prepared by my colleague, Gabriel Rojas, and I'll be your presenter today. So what we'll we be looking at, so some motivation words, then have a look at the ACDC switch power supply basics, some input output measurements that are popular, switching stage analysis, and then conclude everything with some final remarks. So what's the motivation? Basically, um, from a design perspective, first you'll have a definition of the architecture, you'll select the circuits, the design of the PCBs, you might do some simulations. And finally, we have to conclude um, with the testing. So we'll have to verify um, the sub-circuit switching times of the transistors, also switching losses. We'll have to characterize the passive components. So if they are uh, matching to the um, initially planned results, so meaning ripple efficiency and also the um, stability of the supply itself. Of course, efficiency overall is of interest. And at the end, also electromagnetic compatibility so that your SMPS is not causing too much interference in your whole setup. When we are looking about the new upcoming wide band gap materials, um, we're seeing, okay, with silicon, silicon carbide, gallium nitride, switching frequencies increase and also does the power density that could be achieved. And both will cause us some headaches. So the increased power integration density will mean we're 
also having to take care about how to get the heat dissipated from the switching devices when there are losses occurring. And also by having a higher switching frequency, we'll have to ensure that these are not causing us headaches in the other EMC bands. So that when we are doing investigations inside the EMC chamber. Basically what's an AC-DC conversion needed for? Typically we'll have an AC mains and then we'll have some DC charged or supplied um, equipment at the end. So it doesn't matter if it's a battery, a cell, a computer, TV set. Basically all of these have the same needs. So we're having the need for a DC supply at the end. Traditionally, um, we are using linear power supplies. So we'll have a transformer with a good old iron core inside. We'll have the diodes for rectification. And then at the end, we'll also have to ensure that the ripple gets reduced. And therefore we are having the circuitry next to that. Nowadays, to reduce the losses and also to shrink down the devices itself, we're no longer using um, iron cores um, at the input stage. We are adding an input filter. We are having the diodes and we'll have our switching com converter here at the switching stage. Inside, we are doing then more or less a switching between high and low. And at the end, we also have some filter networks needed. Um, and most commonly, we'll have these LSC tanks at the output and a regulation load. Uh, so we have a target load and we'll have a feedback loop which controls again the switching of the devices to ensure we are meeting the voltage and the current at the output. For power supplies with a certain amount of power, you're mandatorily forced to have a PFC, so an active power factor correction inside. And this shall ensure that you're having a phase match between current and voltage and thus reduce the losses. So also the losses on the AC mains meaning that we are not consuming an excessive amount of blind power at the um, power supply itself. Different modes of operation here for the PFC converter. So you could have a fixed frequency average current mode, or you could have the transition mode. Um, this is more or less important to know how this operates if you'd like to go for the further debugging and analysis, analysis in the circuitry. In general, um, it all depends on the calculation power you're willing and able to spend there. So if you're taking the one or other thing first, and then of course also for the overall efficiency settings. Which measurements are of interest? So we have some input and at the input for an AC-DC or DC-DC converter, we'll have to ensure that a certain amount of harmonics is not exceeded, all of the power quality matches the needs and how this converter handles the inrush current behavior. At the output, we'll have a ripple, load transient, load regulation. And overall, when doing the input output characteristic measurements, we'd like to have an overall efficiency, power up and also power down sequencing. Let's start with the input characteristics. When we're looking at the power quality, so first of all, the power factor correction shall ensure, as mentioned already, that our current and voltage are not having a certain phase shift. So not, we are only consuming more or less um, resistive like power consumption here. And this helps us to um, save energy costs because we don't have to pay someone to provide this blind energy to us. Also efficiency is um, increased and we can reduce the components inside our supply. So we don't have to add additional caps or inductors. And that's why it's very helpful to take care about this phase shift in between. What's behind? In general, all we are consuming is the apparent power. And if we are lucky, we are only having reactive power um, uh, only having real power, and we'd like to avoid excessive consumption of the reactive power to um, not get the phase shift in between the voltage and current at the end. What's the power factor? Power factor means what's the relation between our real power and the overall consumed power 
And this gives us at the end also the relation of the load itself. Crest factor, what does that mean? So we're having a, in an idle case at the AC mains and sinusoidal waveform. And if we are taking the crest factor into account, um, this gives us a relation between the peak value, so the absolute maximum value and the RMS value. So these typically 230 volts in Europe um, or 100 volts, 10 volts in the US um, to the square root of two as a maximum value. So if the crest factor delivers the square root of two as a result, you'll immediately know that's a perfectly sign. As soon as we are not getting a square root of two, and this deviates, we'll see, okay, that we are having no longer a nicely shaped AC. Um, so it's not no longer a sine wave and we'll have to take care how to clean it up to prevent the um, excitation of our switch mode power supply with these higher frequency components that will be hidden inside the signal, as well as to prevent the propagation from the input of the power supply to the output. Also, what we like to avoid is this flat topping so that we are more or less only getting a rectangular signal instead of a um, AC signal to our switch mode power supply. Why are these input harmonics so harmful? Um, if we'll think about um, the losses, higher frequency components will cause also higher losses due to the parasitic effects that might resonate inside these devices. Also, electromagnetic interference could be caused by these because they have a different uh, propagation model. And if your filters are not designed um, correctly to prevent that, um, you might have a propagation from the input of the switch power supply to the output. And then you'll have a more or less other propagation path um, inside your system. Also, overheating could be caused and that shall be prevented. For the um, PFC itself, also total harmonic distortion is a crucial parameter. And here we're just comparing the RMS values. For the output, we'd like to see how much ripple and of course other disturbances might be caused by the switching itself or by coupling from the input to the output of the switch mode power supply in the surrounding of our target output value. If we'll think about today's electronic systems, there's only one trend quite obvious. So more or less each of these active components we'd like to power up has its own preferred voltage. And this does not necessarily even have to be one volt. It could be even 300 millivolts, 500 millivolts, you name it. And thus also the tolerances, if you'll take that into account, lead to a real low voltage value that can be tolerated. Um, by the input of these active devices. So that's why it's very important to characterize these so-called parts, so periodic and random deviations around your um, DC supply line. We'll have there ripple, switching noise, load step, LC tank behavior, as well as random noise. Um, noise is always a tough thing because noise shall be unbounded in the frequency domain and also a slight a hint for the definition. Typically, everything above 20 hertz is meant by this AC noise. Everything below is meant as output drift. So also here, please be cautious when doing these investigations. Um, it might be that you'll see some thermal drift behavior, which will be low frequency effects, and everything above might more or less only be, re uh, be related to your switching inside the switch mode power supply. What's in with these transients? So if we are looking at the signal itself, that shall be our intended output voltage. Our ripple is always meant for this uh, sinusoidal shaped behavior. And then we have on top these non-related switching transients. These could be in phase, out of phase to the sine wave. So they don't have to necessarily occur at the top or bottom. They can more or less occur at any position on the sine wave. This, the bad thing on these peaks is these ha are having steep edges. Steep edges mean they are inducing a wide frequency spectrum. And if your probing solution, we'll talk about later on, um, is insufficiently the, um, chosen. So you are having a lack of bandwidth in that case. 
um, you might be unable to see the full beauty of the peak and thus you might have an underestimation um, in your pre-investigations before you go to a customer site doing measurements maybe also at the EMI lab. And this could lead, um, lead to some headaches when you see, okay, what's coming up there and where it's coming from. So it's very important to always think about um, what am I expecting inside my switch mode power supply as the steepest edges. And with this, you will get a definition of your needed bandwidth of your oscilloscope and probing solutions at the end. When doing investigations on power rails, of course, the most common one would be using a passive probe. So these 10 by 1 probes are typically delivered with any oscilloscope on the market. And if we'll do so, we'll have some pros and cons for this uh, probing system. Um, it's cheap, it's there, you could just connect it. But at the end, using a 10 by 1 probe always gives you a headache because this 10 by 1 probe gives an attenuation at the beginning of the probe head. So each voltage is attenuated by a factor of 10. And as the oscilloscope recognizes this 10 by 1 divider ratio, um, it's automatically multiplying every sampled voltage point internally with a factor of 10. So also the base noise of the instrument is magnified by a factor of 10. And if you look at today's oscilloscopes, typically you'll find in smaller um, vertical scales an input noise of about one millivolt peak to peak quite easily. And if you remember the previous table, but you shall qualify a ripple of up to 10 millivolt peak to peak. So one millivolt of noise may multiplied with a factor of 10 would immediately cause you some issue because you would have then already 10 millivolts on screen and then every additional peak would cause you a violation of your target. Additionally, DC blocks are quite commonly used to suppress the sampling of the DC offset. So for these probes, it could happen for the higher um, um, power voltage supplies that you will have an offset that is larger than the offset compensation can handle inside the oscilloscope then you would have to shift your uh, measurement range from five milliwatts maybe to one volt or 10 volt per division for being able to capture the DC offset. And thus you would reduce the number of bits of the ADC being available to capture your noise on your rail. So if you'd like to have any rail measured as flat as possible, just use a large enough input scale when it looks flat. But if you're using a DC block, you run into another issue. So we've been talking about these low frequency deviations and each DC block has a lower and an upper um, 3 dB corner frequency and its free, um, input frequency range characteristic. And with this lower frequency cutoff uh, point, we are, at, um, we are adding attenuation to these lower frequencies and thus these will be suppressed in the measurement result. So if you'd like to qualify frequencies below the lower frequency point, you would run into an issue because you will no longer be able to qualify these when activating AC coupling or adding the DC block. If you're having an external DC block, you might get at least a specification. Typically for oscilloscopes, the internal AC coupling is not specified. So you'll have no chance without using the external signal generator, performing a sweep, seeing when the sine wave you're entering there gives you the full amplitude again. Um, but that would be additional effort. That's why typically we not recommend to use DC blocks if they can be avoided. Um, there are also some one by one passive probes at the market. And for these, you'll have some drawbacks in the limited offset range. So same issue like the passive probe. If you're exceeding the input offset range of this probe, um, then you'll have to use ADC bits to sample the DC offset instead of sampling um, what you'd like to see, the ripple. But as it is a one by one probe, you immediately see the noise behavior is nicer because you see the noise is not magnified like for the 10 by one probe. Um, but due to maybe limited bandwidth, so these probes typically go up to 30 or 40 megahertz in that range. Um, you'll see that these peaks might occur, but they might already be low pass filtered. 
So also not the best solution, but it's a very convenient and price sensitive solution too. That's why for a certain while, the so-called power rail probes are available. The probe itself is a trans impedance converter, um, which is housed into this um, box here at the bottom. We'll have a coaxial cable, which could be connected to a solder rim. So that's a coaxial cable where you'll have the center pin available and the ground connection, and then could easily solder that into your design at the certain test points. With this, you'll get bandwidths um, for the coupling bandwidths um, of two to four gigahertz and an offset range between 60, 70 volts, depending on the model. The cool thing is having an active amplifier inside. We're having a one by one attenuation ratio. And we are also able with this high offset range to use the full ADC range with full bandwidth of two or four gigahertz of the probe system um, to see what's happening. Just to give you also some background, why two or four gigahertz? Um, it's not that we are expecting um, that your switch mode power supply will give you such high harmonics. Um, it's more or less also a general purpose debugging tool. And if you think about this increased integration density, so you'll have more or less in every device nowadays, a Bluetooth, wireless LAN, um, LTE, 5G modem, what else inside? And for being able to see these different bands and their relation and coupling on the power rails itself, um, it's very helpful to have this bandwidth. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to characterize if there is a crosstalk or not. And you might see these high frequency components um, that could easily propagate through a rail to your system on chip and then cause there a watchdog um, saying, oh, I'm out of spec here and I'd like to reboot. And this might um, be the cause um, by this unattenuated um, propagation inside the system. What else to keep in mind? So if we're having a switch mode power supply, it shall power something. And at the end, if we'll have a system on chip, or FPGA, ASIC, doesn't matter, um, and it starts to do something or anything, it will consume some current that's shown here. So the currents could jump significantly between the different values. And the jump in the current will immediately cause a drop in the voltage. And you as a design engineer have to ensure that your power supply is able to provide that amount of charge to, to get the current out of the, out to the system and thus avoid also this voltage drop. So at the beginning, it's quite normal. We're seeing some drop. Then we'll see then where regulation takes place and also feeds the um, charge back to the system. And the question always will be, is this now acceptable or not? And that's why also you'll have to know what will be the maximum and minimum um, charges you'll have to see uh, inside your system. And thus also know the slew rates that would occur by drawing the current out of your switch mode power supply. For the load regulation, also it's important to calculate what's happening between no load and full load, and that you're not exceeding a certain output voltage range when drawing these different currents. When having measured the input and output characteristics, so we have ensured our AC source is not providing an excessive amount of high frequency energy to our DUT, which is the switch mode power supply. And also thus it is ensured that this cannot be propagated unintendedly to your load. Um, also we have validated that the output power itself is okay. So the load step response is okay. We might be interested in qualifying the to overall efficiency of our design. And there we'll need to measure the output voltage current as well as the input voltage current and then ensure um, to do the maths here. In addition, we might not only watch at this for one working condition. Also, this is strongly depending on our load we are using there. And thus, uh, you'll typically get such diff uh, many curves. So curves, so some in snooze mode, some with defined loads, 
And this, this gives you an immediate overview about the overall power consumption, which might be crucial if you'll design a small battery powered IoT um, device, which shall only wake up every now and then. And then it's important to know how much current is drawn for which working condition to do a lifetime assumption of that battery. If we'd like to do these um, calculations of the consumed power properly, we'll always have to know if the current and the voltage are aligned properly. So both of these probes, independent if it's an active passive probe, but um, all probes have a different group delay. So meaning we'll have to know the individual delay of these probes for being able to have a proper alignment between the voltage and current. And therefore, some example here shown. Um, my colleagues once designed a so-called power disk queue fixture where you'll have the chance to connect your um, voltage probe, your current probe across the board. And due to the known relation between the current and the voltage at these two test points, you are now able to disk queue your system. Later on, in most cases, you will be not able to use such a fixture. But um, as you know, what kind of switching devices you will have in the what kind of reactions will be happening when you'll have a certain load jump. Um, you could align these different um, voltages and currents quite easily by, for example, searching for the Miller plateau when doing investigations inside the switch mode power supply or by known characteristics um, of your design itself. So here it's very important to just keep in mind, you'll have to disk you to do a proper um, efficiency calculation at the end. Otherwise, your efficiency might be lower of your device due to this effect that voltage and current are not in phase. Also, power up and power up sequencing plays a more and more important role nowadays. So what does that mean? At the beginning, we'll have to power up our board in a certain order. So first of all, the power switch mode power supplies have to be um, ensured that they are turned on. They are giving the right voltage rails at the output, and maybe you'll have a power, man power management IC, a so-called PEMEC, in addition on your board, which then regulates the outputs and powers the different power supplies up in a certain manner, but the DUT is coming up in a well-defined way and is not already transmitting or trying to transmit, transmit something while the backend is not running and so forth. And therefore, also it's very important to know what will be the maximum inrush current I'm allowed to consume at the beginning of my chain of maybe different or many switch mode power supplies and also um, well, which overshoots shall be achieved at a maximum. So this is a complete system behavior test. And typically you'll need not only one, two channels, um, you also need several of these different signals to correlate the system behavior. And then you're seeing, okay, what's coming here for a voltage for the current um, consumed at the end and do these match still the requirements that I have um, been given in the data sheet up front? So a typical startup sequence is we're getting here the sine wave in the back, which already starts as maybe a clock. Then also other consumption at the bottom is shown for a certain voltage level, ramp up takes place. And all these timings could then easily be measured uh, using cursors, maybe automatic malfunctions, using maybe also gated measurement functions. So meaning you're adding different timing gates to do different measurements and see at the end if your supply and your system match quite well together or if there are different hiccups coming up. So it might not take only eight cycles, it takes maybe eight and a half or nine cycles to get the reference voltage out of a certain uh, switch power supply and then you could start debugging in your design how to power up these different um, supplies and still ensure that you're not exceeding the maximum power consumption at the input port of the device and also ensure that sufficient amount of power is always provided to your different parts of the design. For the power down, it's more or less the same. So if we'd like to power down a device in a controlled manner, 
it's sometimes also needed that we'll first switch, up in, switch off in a certain order. So to avoid that we are getting overshoots, um, we are preventing also uncontrolled and maybe destructive um, and thus maybe destructive um, uh, voltage overshoots inside your system. So if you'll think about an inductor and you'd like to cut off the powers of power at such an inductor immediately, this would cause you a lot of ringing and headaches afterwards. Um, what happened? And that's why it's very important to power down in a certain order to ensure that all power that has to be um, that you'll have to get rid of first is um, gone away, and thus it's unable to resonate in your system. What could be done when we will know? Okay, at least I'll have everything made that I um, was promising in my data sheet. But now still, I'd like to go deeper in the switching stage. So first question would be, like always, for selecting your measurement system, which bandwidth do I need? This strongly depends on the measurement equipment. So for the shown MX04 with an RTZHD um, high voltage differential probe, um, you could assume your bandwidth by this formula. So the needed bandwidth will be 0 0.35 divided by the rise time of your switch you'd like to investigate. And for this example, if we'll have a four nanosecond rise time, this would result into approximately 90 megahertz of frequency input range needed here. Um, you'll find different of these formulas. So stating uh, one divided by pi uh, multiplied with the rise time, or you'll find um, 0 0.5 so, or one divided by two times the rise time. Um, this always, depends strongly on the input filter characteristic. So if you'll check the data sheet of your measurement system, so the probe as well as the scope, then um, you'll find the formulas and you could easily use them. Um, if you'd like to do a much more easy and generic assumption, you could always take 0 0.5 divided by the rise time because this will give you the most conservative estimation of the bandwidth needed. What shall be done? First of all, if we'd like to see um, our switching stage, we are switching between a certain low and high value. And there we are interested, first of all, in the slew rate, so that we are not too fast or too slow. Also, how large is the overshoot, ringing, and the differentiation between ringing and overshoot is quite easy. So ringing is something where you'll have a very consistent way. So you could draw a line over these amplitudes and then this concludes to zero. While an overshoot has a high, very high peak and a, settles immediately afterwards. So that's a very easy thing to differentiate if this is maybe a ringing, so caused by some resonances inside the system, or if it is an overshoot, so maybe caused by some um, inductor or other system behavior. Also, a voltage drop might be of interest for you. So meaning, what's the relation between the high value at the beginning and at the end of your measurement? If you're comparing um, the slew rates or maximum slew rates that could be measured and the rise times that could be measured with the given intrinsic rise times of your oscilloscope, please always be aware oscilloscope is always specified to measure at 10, 90 value. If your definition of your DUT gives you at 20, 80, 25, 75, doesn't matter. Um, this always means that you'll have to translate these other boundary conditions to your oscilloscope, which will give you a 1090 value. So you could assume that your linear range of the oscilloscope um, is then um, faster because this 1090 value, you could decrease to a 25, 75 or something like that. So that's a, just a linear scale and then you'll get the values for 25, 75. In addition, it's very important to also be aware your software inside the oscilloscope will always, as a default value, give you in a rise time measurement, the 10 to 90 values. If you are now having these other specifications and you'd like to reproduce some data sheet values of your colleagues, it's always important to adjust these settings in the firmware of the oscilloscope to do the measurements at the right positions here. 
on that small space, it is stated here. So please be aware if you're having 1090, 2080 uh, values, also which voltages you'd like to measure. So gate source, drain source, and also that you shall not forget if you'd um, like to align um, high side, low side gates measurements. Um, also be aware that you'll have to, first of all, know the skew between the input channels. Maybe also know the skew of your adaption from the measurement points to be able to really get to the uh, tightest uh, margins for your dead time analysis so that you're ensuring that your high side and low side gate are not active at the same time. So meaning that you're not building a short circuit between high potential and ground. So basically, let's try getting to the robustness testing. And here again, SQ has to be considered between all the input channels. And that's a probe individual thing as well as channel individual thing. So if you're exchanging the probes between the channels, you'll have to start again to do the alignment and the disk queuing between the channels because it's always a function of probe plus channel. And if you're exchanging the channel, of course, there's another number state behind. Which are measurements are very popular and what to keep in mind for current topologies and technologies. So if we are only investigating the low, um, lower gates and, low, and the low side transistors there, everything is ground referenced. That's quite convenient and easy because there you'll always have a ground connection and that's why it's more or less a don't care. You'll just take the voltage values and look into the data sheet of the probe and say, yes, that's good to go. As soon as we are talking about a high side gate measurement or a high side measurement in general, so high side VDS or VGS measurement, there we'll have the um, drawback that our source will not be connected to ground. This one will be connected to a floating potential. And especially for floating measurements, it's very important to know the common mode rejection of your probe. Um, because this will give you then the finite limitation for the measurement accuracy. So even if you're connecting the P and N port of your probe to the same testing point, which typically will be the floating potential at the source, um, you'll see some remaining voltage ripple coming up from the switching event from gate to source. And that's due to this limited common mode rejection um, ratio inside your system. On top of that, when investigating silicon carbide, gallium nitride um, gate drivers, typically these are floating too. So it's always depending on more how high their isolation impedance against the environment and um, the ground itself is. And independency of this relation between the gate isolation and the isolation provided by the differential probe, you'll see more or less effects. So adding a high voltage differential probe without a galvanic isolation could cause you ringing effects at the gate source and might lead to destruction of your device um, due to the parasitic couplings inside the probe. So that's why it's important to be aware you not necessarily have to have issues here, but if you'd like to test if you really need a very expensive isolated probe or if maybe the differential voltage probe would be okay, I always recommend to do these tests with the smallest possible current consumption of your device. So at the end, that you'll avoid destruction if you might get a, a short circuit by the gate characteristics here. What's important to know? So if we'd like to measure losses at the end, we'll have our drain source current, our voltage, and of course, the switching loss is determined immediately by multiplication of these two current, of these two um, channels, so current and voltage. And as you already could imagine, um, I've mentioned we'll have a specific delay for each probe. And if we'd like to now do a proper um, power consumption calculation, we'll have to know if IDS comes uh, more early or later because this will immediately change the conduction losses and the switching losses. In addition, also the inductor current is uh, sometimes quite tough to measure. So to see if your inductor is saturated, desaturated, or maybe also causing you some over voltages you didn't expect there. Um, the crucial thing here is to measure the inductor current properly 
you'll have to change something in your system anyhow. So always be aware if you're measuring something, you might cause issues in your system, um, especially if you'll go to the output of your inductor and you're adding a certain wire, this will change the effective inductance inside your measurement system. And thus you'll see different measurement results at the end. So that's what's shown on that slide. If you're using such a structure, you'll have your inductor plus the loop inductance where you're adding the probe. And typically it's better to use a shunt resistor because it's less invasive than adding these long wires. Um, but also here, you'll have to be aware if you have the need to qualify real slow, um, real small currents, and also real high currents while having the negative path here, um, then your dynamic range will be limited by the proper selection of the shunt resistor, as well as the probe that is measuring the voltage across this resistor. So as mentioned again, we will have some floating potential across the shunt. And through this um, floating potential, we might have a limitation in the effective ripple and also noise behavior later on. So also here, it could be a good idea to use an isolated probe to get rid of the offset voltage and use in as low as possible dy ratio and thus increase your versatility in your measurement. This brings me to the end. So the final remarks, um, we've had a brief view about what's popular to measure for AC and DC, DC switch mode power supplies. Um, there are many more measurements that are of interest for you if you're integrating and designing these um, different tests. So robustness was only touched briefly. Inrush current analysis has not been discussed in that detail. Um, we'll have double pulse testing. And especially the double pulse could be of more interest in the future for you because double pulse does not necessarily force you to only qualify how is the behavior between the high side, low side gate. It could also be used to qualify the overall system behavior so that you're using a reference load to your complete system and then do the analysis on different switching patterns, different switching um, schemes like we've seen previously from for Florian's presentation with the um, spread spectrum clocking that might be used. And then you could also do an estimate already inside these test systems um, on the losses effectively and also the system behavior. In general, the parasitics are causing us the most headaches and the higher the frequencies get, the more harmful are these parasitic effects. And that's also something we'll take care in the presentation of next week, how our measurement system is affected by these high frequency components and also how to um, get a good accuracy or at least a reproducible measurement out of our setup. A last remark, which I'm always um, emphasizing at the end of such presentations, Today's oscilloscopes offer a very powerful FFT already inside. I guess you've already seen that at Florian's presentation, and also you'll see something on that in the presentation of Arturo. Um, an oscilloscope has an FFT, and please use that, because it's always good to be prepared if you're going to the EMI lab at the end or doing more enhanced analysis. Switch on the FFT, it takes about five to maybe 10 additional minutes on your setup at your desk and you immediately see what's happening inside your system, which frequency components occur and you are already better prepared to see also from which stages in your design these might be occurring if you'd like to hunt down the EMC issues. Also, there's a nice app note. You'll get the material afterwards like we've already heard and thus please be happy uh, to download that one. It's very informative and also contains a lot of the material I presented today. So thank you very much and I'll be happy for your questions. Thanks, Alan, Alexander. Lots of good stuff today. Uh, so as we've mentioned before, there's a Q&A button over the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface and you can just type in questions there. And we do have quite a few in there already so we're just gonna jump right in the first one was if 
if my input current is chopped, it's a triangle DCM operation, but the envelope follows the voltage and THD is 10% to 2,500 Hertz. Can I say the PF is more than 0.98? That's a tough one. I'd like to answer that afterwards <laughs> to not uh, do the wrong calculations in my head, if that's okay. <laughs> no problem. We will move on to the next one. That was a pretty technical one. But as I think I mentioned on the last one, we have all of these captured and, and we'll uh, send out an email with some of these answers as well. Uh, next one was how many seconds is the appropriate transient time as, at startup? So um, basically there is no real rule of thumb um, because this all depends on your power up behavior uh, at all. So if you'd like to switch on everything quite fast in your design, you'll have the need for getting high amount of current from your grid or your supply. So if you think about a mains connection, this might not be such a huge issue, but if we, you'll think about a battery powered device, the battery will provide you a maximum current. So it's um, not that you're stating, okay, this is a fixed amount of time, it's the other way around. You'll have to ensure under all circumstances that your sequencing leads to um, a maximum current, which not exceeds the uh, capabilities of the, your source. And that's why um, this is not uh, quite something I could answer with. It's always 10 microseconds. Um, it, it strongly depends on your needs afterwards. And this has to be ensured in the cycling. It's a cycling definition itself. OK, and I'm not sure if this was a follow-up question, but I think it was. What is the standard between fast and slow? Um, sorry, I did not get the relation right now. Um, um, yeah, I, maybe we'll find it out uh, in the recording later on <laughs> oh, yeah. more, more on what uh, this question targets to. Sounds good. Uh, what is the right way to measure the emissions of the switching node and input circuit of an SMPS? So um, uh, we'll have to differentiate in that way. Um, if you're doing the analysis in general about the switching behavior, um, you could use any instrument in that way because you'd like to see the spectrum, you'd like to see if the switching happens to the right timing. And major target will be to not destroy your um, device at the end. So the, that's the first thing. Um, I always like mentioned in my last comment, emphasize that you're activating the FFT function. So you're using the same setup to do a pre-qualification if only these components, so this sorry, the switching frequency itself um, occurs and also the harmonics related to the um, switching frequency generation, which will be more or less rectangular jumps you're having there. Um, as soon as we are going for the system behavior, we are looking only at the input and output um, voltages and currents. So using there maybe a listen, so a line impedance stabilization network, maybe also a dual listen, so taking a, the coupling from the P and the N. Um, so the cool thing with using a dual listen will be that you immediately see the common mode and the differential mode noise. And then you could easily see if your filters you positioned at the outsides of your switch mode power supply are operating sufficiently and as intended. Um, this will all be um, something you could do at your bench. And this would be called then pre-compliance analysis. If we're then putting that on a higher level, then you'll need to be more close to the standards. So, then you'll have the definition from the EMI standards, how the setup should look like. You'll need a shield chamber and so forth. So it could become quite fast, quite complicated and expensive because then you'll need at a certain point the measurement receivers as well as the standard um, approved listens. And of course, um, the EMI receiver at the end for um, taking them from the listen or from the antenna, these signals. For everything you could do at the bench, 
typically you're good to go with a listen. So it could also be a custom listen, a ground plane where the listen and the DUT have the same reference at least. And um, also using a near field probe to correlate the noise you see with the portions of your device. So you could see what's happening at the inductors, what's happening um, across your switching devices, and maybe also see, okay, if a ground loop or something occurs, which is radiating or resonating, you'll easily find that also later on with a, a near field probe set. So for everything you could do at the bench with low effort, low cost, a near field probe set, a self-built, dual listen um, would be recommended. But that's again, not 100% yeah, um, then correlated to your EMI measurements. It's only giving you an indication if you're better with these certain countermeasures or if you'll have to do further investigations here. So, sorry for the long answer. <laughs> very, very comprehensive. Uh... The next one, what is your recommended way to measure inductor current? So um, here the inductor current would follow my recommendation previously. I would always prefer to use a shunt and then use a differential probe over that shunt um, because it's the most accurate and broadband measurement you could get right now. Um, of course, you'll have to decide if you'd like to do a measurement then current correct or voltage correct. So the efficiency has to be done in two steps. If you'd like to do these investigations on the losses, um, you'll have to decide if you're now measuring the current in the inductor or the voltage there, because both measurements will affect each other um, in a way that you'll have to decide which one to take first and then the second. Thank you. Next up. What recommendations are there for measuring low current, like uh, milliamps and and UA for for battery powered devices? Yes. So for these um, IoT devices, we'll have sleep currents in the microampere range going up to milliampere. Um, if we're only going through this. Um, three dimensions from micro to milli, this might be okay to use averaging and so forth because typically these currents don't change that fast. So there are solutions with more than eight bit available on the market. So you could use rather than your MX04 with a 12 bit ADC, um, also using low pass filtering to get rid of wide band noise of your front band and so forth. Um, for the RTO platform, we are having an additional um, box which provides you about one megahertz of bandwidth. This is still called RT minus ZVC. And um, therefore with a 12-bit ADC, which will give you sufficient dynamic range. So that's a more or less sophisticated task. And that would be also something to discuss in a follow-up. Um, what would be the right solution in dependency of what else should be done? Because typically it's not only sleep and wake up current you'd like to see. Also, maybe you'd like you'd be interested in doing some control or measurements, seeing what's happening there. Thank you. Uh, a little non. Can can you put the link of the testing manual that you showed in the in the laser slide? Did, is that something we can easily get out to them, Alexander? Y yes, of course. We'll provide that afterwards um, with the slides. Great. Next one. What about using the coaxial cable without without a DC block? What termination do I need to use on the scope? One mega ohm or fifty ohm? If using a one mega ohm termination, is that an issue? Um, I guess that targets to the slide with the different probes. So the ten by one, one by one probe. Um, if you just connect immediately the front end of the oscilloscope with a coaxial cable to your DUT, you'll have to ensure that the capacitive load you're adding to your DUT um, is okay for your switch mode power supply or the line you'd like to investigate. Um, the choice of 50 ohm or 1 mega ohm um, primarily 
is depending on the voltage level. So for 50 ohm, you shall not exceed typically for the scopes we're talking in this presentation about um, of about plus minus five volt. If you're exceeding that, you have anyhow no chance to um, not use one mega ohm. But with the one mega ohm, you'll have to be aware that you no longer have a non-reflective termination at the end of the cable. So your excitation at the beginning of the cable will travel to your front end and then back to your device. And this could maybe cause you, in worst case scenario, an um, constructive interference at your testing point, which leads to an overvoltage at your device and might lead to destruction there. So I would not recommend to directly connect the front end itself due to loading and these resonance effects. If you might want to use one mega ohm termination at the input of the scope, and you'll have the chance to design your own 50 ohm termination, which could handle the max voltage. Then you could do it like for the older Ethernet standards, you'll have the termination at the end of your line. And in parallel with a T, you'll have one mega ohm input of the scope measuring the signals. So that would be possible. Um, but only for lower frequencies in the range up to one or 10 megahertz as a maximum. Above the reflections and the terminations get such imperfect that with, this would cause more distortions when using an active probe. Okay, thank you. Uh, when computing switching losses, should, should the time be set as high as possible? Um, that, that's also a pure yes and no, because if you did not do the de-skewing upfront, you could take your measurement time as long as you'd like to, you will always get an error. Um, basically, the first thing to know is you could do the loss calculation even in a one shot with a single acquisition um, over one pulse. Um, this would give you a bad statistic um, on your device, but um, if you have discute everything properly and your device is statistic statistically behaving nicely, then you see immediately the correct losses. Um, typically, I would recommend to first of all do the desk queue and afterwards let the measurement run over a certain amount of time to see if maybe also heating changes the behavior and the losses um, due to parasitic effects um, like thermal coefficients and so forth. Thank you. Should overshoot or undershoot be measured from initial voltage or final voltage after transient? <laughs> That's always uh, on a good one because these definitions are typically made by standards or the data sheets, how these shall be measured. Um, I've seen everything, so I cannot give a direct recommendation to do it always in one manner. Um, what you shall be keeping in mind though is um, the over and under shoot might not always be a pure function of your system. So this is also depending on the input front end characteristic. And thus this might cause differences in your measurement when using different uh, measurement devices. So here sometimes it's helpful if you're uncertain if it's uh, the measurement system itself or not to exchange the probe if you'll have two different probes that could be capable for this measurement, or maybe also to use another scope, or if you're comparing to colleagues to ensure at least that you first of all did the measurements with the same um, thresholds. So like this 1090, 2080 discussion I made in the presentation. And of course, um, also to know if these refer um, automatic measurements, if you're using that inside the scope, are referencing then also to the high, the absolute peak, the mean or the low values. These could be typically adjusted and these are also typical errors. So it's very important to document also if you have made some changes to these definitions, which you have done and to, to align on that. Otherwise, um, reproducibility of measurement results will be impossible. So if you'll get these things from your colleagues without any statements, um, please always ask with which settings did you do these measurements? Great. Uh, next one, could you please repeat, what is the challenge to measure the high side FET regarding common mode rejection? Um, 
the the challenge always is that um, all probes have a somehow limited common mode rejection. So the common mode rejection ratio gives you the influence if you're taking the same test point for the P and N input of your probe. Then you'll have a floating potential due to the switching of the high side um, transistor. And then you'll get a certain ripple at the output of the probe stated. And let's assume you'll have one kilovolt, you'll have about um, 30 dB of attenuation in between, you'll get a resulting ripple out of, uh, sorry, 60 dB of attenuation in between. This would give you immediately a factor of 1000 of attenuation. So from one kilovolt, one volt of amplitude would be left. And this one is frequency dependent. So you will always have to know which frequency range you are in. And then you could check the data sheet with the given common mode rejection plots um, there um, and do an assumption how large would be the resulting voltage. And below that value, um, you cannot longer qualify the output ripple because you don't know if it's coming from the switching or if it's a real ripple behavior of your system. So it's an, just a matter of um, identifying what will be the real measurement value? Okay. Um, back to the inductor. Is it is it better to measure the inductor current before or after the inductor? That's also a tough one. Typically, I'll measure the inductor current at the output because that's the consumed current from the DUT typically. Um, if you'd like to do the analysis on the mains connection, then you would measure it up front. So it all depends on which way the energy shall flow or which energy flow you'd like to characterize. All right, so I think we are gonna end up in the same boat as the, the first session with lots of great questions and not quite enough time. So we are gonna transition to uh, Arturo now and Arturo is going to cover for uh, cover for us uh, EMI EMC debugging conducted in missions with oscilloscopes. Um, so I do want to uh, reserve his time. Um, but but as I mentioned uh, with Florian's presentation, um, we will go through these questions and we'll we'll put together an, an email or something where where we address all these. So. Appreciate everyone being highly engaged today in getting this to us. Um, so uh, I would like to, uh, Arturo, can you go ahead and share your slides? Yes, uh, can you listen to me? Yeah, you sound great. Excellent, let's share the screen and let me know if you can see it, not, not this one, sorry. Let me share the screen. Oh, we had you and then. This one. And this one. Oh, in theory, is this is not a screen. You you see the screen? Yeah, you look great right now. Okay, it's is with the main title and my face, no? In in the camera. Yeah, we 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 got both. We get to see the the okay. live version of you today, so that's great. So okay, uh, okay, thank so you, yeah. thank you. I, we I'll can just turn it over to you. I was going to give you a little bit of an intro, but I'll just let you run with it since we've been short on time today. Okay, okay, so. Let's start today uh, with the first part of the uh, uh, two sessions. <clears throat> One is dedicated to conducted emissions, the other to radiated emissions next week. <clears throat> Sorry. The other to radiated emissions next week. And we will be talking about debugging uh, EMI and EMC problems with oscilloscopes. First, let me thank you, um, EMPS and Roden Schwartz for the invitation to make this webinar. And I hope all of you will enjoy with uh, some experiments and some basic ideas. I will be very happy to answer any questions you have at the end of the, of the session. Anyway, let's uh, start considering, uh, for the people that don't know what we are doing here in Zaragoza, in Spain, uh, our laboratory is the HFMI lab. I am working at the University of Zaragoza and we are specialized in solving and analyzing EMI problems. Not something that is not easy and not always we are able to solve problems. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about debugging strategy. Uh, what we will be trying to explain is that uh, oscilloscopes are, in my opinion, one of the best instruments to make debugging uh, of EMI problems. Basically, uh, I find uh, three different uh, considerations. The first one is that the bandwidth of the oscilloscopes 
is uh, easy for today to work with uh, FFT. So they have a strong FFT that is able to go up to gigahertz. So you can use the oscilloscope in conducted and in radiated emissions. The second important thing is that we have several channels. And because we have several channels, we are able to work with different uh, probes. For example, we can use voltage probes. We can use current probes. We can use near field probes, line impedance stabilization networks, and antennas. So if you are trying to measure radiated or uh, conducted emissions, you will be using antennas or line impedance stabilization networks. If you want to do debugging in the near field, you will go to uh, work with uh, electric and magnetic near field probes. And if you are interested in debugging uh, in the in some kind of a circuit theory point of view, you will uh, work with voltage and current probes. Uh, today, we will be working with the oscilloscope for debugging of uh, EMI problems in conducted emissions. So basically, we will be working with the line impedance stabilization network and the oscilloscope. Uh, next uh, webinar, we will cover the idea of radiated emissions, and we will use uh, current probes and the other probes that you can see in the picture. So let's start with conducted emissions. The, most the, the first important thing when trying to understand conducted emissions is that from the power supply to your device under test, you will have a black box that we call line impedance stabilization network. How is the main uh, mission of this uh, black box? The main mission of this black box is to offer to your product a known impedance in that direction. So the noise you are injecting in differential and in common mode is on some kind of impedance that is uh, known for all the people. So measurements in different cities, in different laboratories are close to be uh, similar. Not always will be similar. We have some kind of uh, range, I don't know, plus minus six dBs in, in error, but bas basically we are measuring in the same conditions and we can compare with the same limits. This is the first important uh, function of the listen. The second important function is the idea to avoid EMI going into your setup or EMI going out from your device to the external power supply system. And finally, the third solution, the third option with a listen is to have a voltage, the voltage that we will be measuring in the receiver. You can use EMI receiver, you can use a spectrum analyzers, or you can use, like in our demos, oscilloscopes. Don't forget to use some kind of transient protector in case you are using uh, power electronics, especially devices with uh, strong transients, because uh, sometimes you can uh, destroy or you can uh, damage the input port of your EMI receiver. And this is something that is expensive and usually create delays in the work uh, with your um, uh, design process. No? So basically, when we uh, measure conducted emissions, we will be measuring in some frequency range, for example, from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. This is a common uh, conducted emissions measurement. Sometimes we start at nine kilohertz. Sometimes we stop at 110 megahertz, like in automotive. And what you will see is in the horizontal axis, frequency in logarithmic scale. In the vertical axis, you will see voltage. That is because we can measure dV microvolts. This is the voltage in the output of the line impedance stabilization network. So it is this voltage here is what we are measuring typically in the 50 ohms input impedance of your device, of your instrument. And you will see two different measurements, the black one and the pink one. The black one is when we are using the quasi-peak detector and the uh, um, pink one is uh, when we are using the average detector. That is because you have two limits, the quasi-peak limit and the average limit, the two lines that you can see in the picture. So when we measure our device, we will see different energy at different frequencies. Sometimes this energy is easy to identify. In this example, I start here at 500 kilohertz and going from one peak to the other peak, we find that the distance is 500 kilohertz. That means what? Is that they are harmonics of some specific circuit that is switching in a fixed frequency. No? Sometimes in the emission, you will see a broadband emission, something like this, okay? Something like this, that looks like a mountain, no? This is typically uh, coming from uh, resonances. Uh, one of the examples of resonance is uh, usually ringing uh, because of the parasitic inductance and capacitance in the layout and the uh, packages of your components. 
And something that is very important is to uh, be able to reduce these uh, emissions over the limits going down uh, in this way. So instead of being below the limits in this way, we will try to go below the limits in this way. That is what, but that is because if you are below the limits, I mean, you are complying, but your emissions are increasing when you go uh, to the 30 megahertz or the 100 megahertz frequency, you are uh, complying with conducted emissions, but you have more probabilities to fail later in radiated emissions that start at 30 megahertz. If you uh, pass conducted emissions going down, uh, when you approach to 30 megahertz, you have more probabilities to uh, uh, not having problems in radiated emissions. Anyway, our problem will be to reduce the peaks below the limits. My main uh, recommendation is if you are in this situation, you cannot consider here that you are complying. If you are 0.5, 1 dB below the limit, forget about the idea of you are uh, complying. Because if you change of the laboratory, if you measure different uh, uh, units of your uh, product, you will see uh, some kind of uh, changes. No? So my recommendation is to try to reduce the limit at least 6 dB below the limit. And usually we will try to do this redesigning the circuit with the components, the layout, or applying a spread spectrum like Florian was, was explaining in the first speak, or we will try to solve this problem uh, traditionally by filtering. Filters are expensive, are big, and uh, the most strategical uh, uh, work is to try to minimize the size and the order of this filter. So what we will be doing today is to replicate a very simple measurement with a small device under test. I will be using a small uh, back converter and we will try to replicate something similar to what we find in a CSPR25 setup. It's not perfect, it, you will see now in the camera, but we will be able to uh, explain the main ideas about using the oscilloscope for this uh, task. So from a power supply that is external to my setup, I will get something like plus 20 volts, 15 volts, 16 volts, something like that. And in the output of my device, I will have 12 volts to power, sorry, this is 20 volts. And my uh, back converter is uh, powering a fan that is working at 12 volts. In this way, I uh, take some kind of current from the back converter. Look at the setup. The setup explained that you need a ground plane and some kind of isolation material between the device and the test and the, this metal plane. And we will be using two listens. Uh, the use of one or two listens uh, depends following the CSPR25 with the length of the cables. You have more than 20 meters in cables, you need two listens. You have less than 20 meters, you can use one listen. But you will learn today why we are using two listens. Basically, the idea is that we will be able to separate common mode and differential mode. And this is very important for designing our filter. You can identify additionally in the picture that they have two capacitors, one microfarad external to the listen. This is because if we put the capacitors inside of the listen, we will not be able to use the listen for immunity, okay? So in my setup, the one microfarad capacitor is outside of the listen. And in some uh, commercial listens, you can find the capacitor inside of the listen, but you can switch on or off internally. So uh, from each listen, we will have a BNC connector that is basically here and here, and sorry, here and here. And then with the uh, two uh, uniform transmission lines, two uh, coax cables, 50 ohms coax cables, you can go to the uh, EMI receiver, to the oscilloscope, or you can terminate with some kind of 50 ohms termination. Uh, look at this. The positive terminal of the uh, power supply goes to the uh, one of the listens to power the positive uh, terminal of the device under test, and the negative terminal of the power supply goes through the other listen to power the negative terminal of the device under test. The negative terminal of the listens is connected directly to the ground plane. So when we are measuring with listen number one, we are measuring the noise 
in uh, the positive line. When we are measuring with listen number two, we are measuring the noise in the ground line of my device under test, okay? So the metal plate, is some kind of reference structure, okay? If you are uh, using, uh, interested in different regulations, this setup can change. For example, in CSPR 16 or any other uh, similar uh, regulation, you will need to put your device on top of a table that is non-metallic and the ground plane is in the floor and in the walls. But obviously you need to check uh, the correct setup for your application. So now that we have this uh, uh, fast description of the setup, let me show you uh, what, how we will be working today. Basically, we will have uh, four different uh, cameras or uh, uh, screens. We have the screen, so we will be able to draw uh, in, in, the, in the tablet. We have the screen of the oscilloscope. The screen of my uh, oscilloscope is an RT06 from Roden Schwartz. Let me make a preset. So we see in yellow color is the uh, voltage in channel number one. This is time domain. And in the bottom left, you can see a picture of my setup. Now I will describe, uh, describe uh, uh, soon. And here we will see in the bottom right, we will see details of the device under test. So now let's explain basically how is the setup for our experiment. This is the setup. Okay, so you can see here, let me show you. This is the uh, input voltage. Here you have here uh, between 15 and 20, 30 volts, no? This is a filter. This is a filter that is used to be sure that no uh, noise is coming from the uh, power supply. This is especially important if you are using a switching mode power supply in your laboratory. So the power we apply in our uh, setup is clean, as clean as possible. The negative terminals of the license are connected directly with two short and wide uh, connectors to the uh, ground plane. The ground plane is represented with this aluminum foil. So here, between the red and the red terminals of the line impedance stabilization networks, we have the, here a voltage that is the 20 volts going uh, through this low pass filter to the output to power my device. You see the output of listen number two, the output of listen number one to go to the oscilloscope. You want to see how is the uh, setup. We can switch to the, uh, let me show you here. Let me change the angle of the, of the camera and you will see that uh, close to the line impedance stabilization network, we have the oscilloscope. Here is the oscilloscope. And I will be connecting the output of the listens to channel number one or channel number two. Oh, sorry. I didn't change the camera. You can see here, okay? So you see here the oscilloscope, channel number one and channel number two will be used to uh, measure the output of the listens directly, okay? So let's connect again here to see the details of the device under test, okay? So if we are interested in measuring conducted emissions of the device, we will need to put our device on top of the uh, dielectric material. The H of the dielectric material is usually explained in the regulations. We need to power our device. So I will be using this short cable, in this case for my demo, and we will be powering the power supply here. So now you will see that if I switch on the power supply, the green LED is on. Let me see, you, you can see here the green LED, okay? And now we can connect the fan, that is a 12 volts fan, okay? I'm not sure if you see in the, in the camera that the fan is rotating, no? So it's working as expected. So let's connect here the setup. So we are ready. For measuring. Obviously, if your product is inside of a plastic or a metallic enclosure, you need to replicate the full uh, uh, structure to, to make the measurements. But because uh, I want to, you to see the internal uh, hardware, uh, I am not using a, the, the case of the, of the product, okay? So now that we are here, we can explain what happened in the here 
in the line impedance stabilization network. Look at this. This is the uh, input voltage. So really, my slide, I am talking about mains, line, neutral, and hertz. But forget about this. We are in DC. This is the positive. This is the negative. And this is the uh, metal plate, the ch ch chassis. No? So you can see that for the positive, I have one circuit that is something like an LC circuit. This is the blue line, the blue circuit. OK? Something like this. Usually, the, the uh, resistor that you see here, uh, the 1K resistor here, in mains applications is used for uh, safety. So the capacitors are discharged in, in, in this specific application, are, or can be used for damping uh, resonances in the uh, LC circuit. In my setup for CSPR25, instead of 50 microhenries, we have five microhenries here because the inductance in the automotive uh, lines is lower than the inductance that is expected in the mains uh, application. And you can see that we have another listen. They can be in the same box or they can be in separated boxes with an exact equal circuit. Okay, this is 1K. So where you find the output of your circuit? The output of your circuit, of your listens, is here and here. So you can see that goes to one connector and you go to the other connector. This is out number one and this is out number two. This is the idea. So these connectors are these connectors in my setup. One and two, one and two. They go to the oscilloscope or to the EMI receiver. Okay, so what happened inside of the uh, listen? Inside of the listen, uh, you are uh, receiving differential mode noise in this direction. So the differential mode noise, when arriving to this point, take the decision to go through the capacitor that is a lower impedance than the uh, five microhenries inductor, goes through the capacitor that is close to a source circuit and goes to your 50 ohms resistor. So here we have the 50 ohms resistor of your receiver. So you can see that the voltage you are measuring in the connector one is 50 times the differential mode uh, voltage. But this connector, this uh, ground is connected here, sorry, is connected here, is returning in this direction, is returning in this direction, and this is the return path for the differential mode. So how is the the, the impedance that the device under test see in differential mode is going in this direction, 50 ohms in series with 50 ohms. So the impedance you see in differential mode from the device under test is close to 100 ohms. This is important when you are designing the uh, EMC filter. And what happened with the common mode? With the common mode, the current is going, let me take another color, for example, pink. The common mode is going out here and it's going out here. And you can uh, work in the same way. The current of the common mode goes in this direction, goes in this direction and goes in this direction and it's going in this direction. So something that is very important is that the voltage you get in connector two or the voltage you get in connector one is neither the differential mode or the common mode. This is a mix of differential mode and common mode. And this is an information that is very important if you are interested in designing the filter. So what now we are going to do is to measure with my oscilloscope, how is the noise we are injecting in the setup, in my setup, when the power supply is on. So let's switch to the screen of the instrument. You see here, is a oscilloscope, this is voltage, this is time, and in yellow color, this is the output from uh, the, the signal in channel number one. If we switch here, channel number one will be used to measuring listen one here. And the second port is terminated with 50 ohms. If you want to measure in uh, listen number two, the negative terminal, you need to change one 
uh, by the other. Okay, you can see in the screen of the oscilloscope that we have the time domain signal of the uh, emissions. Okay. Anyway, I am not going to use the oscilloscope with this software. I am going to open another software that is uh, this one. This is a software that is coming with the RDO6, where I can specify what uh, range frequency range I am interested in. For example, with V, I am interested between 150 kilohertz and 30 megahertz. I can specify, for example, uh, the peak. I'm going to consider that I am interested in um, this limit and this limit for the average, and we uh, establish the setup. Now we need to put here zero dBs and we set up the RTO, something like this. Now we recover the FFT traces from the oscilloscope. And in a few moments, I will show you, oh, let me go back, it's here, sorry, here. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the, here the peak and the average emissions of my uh, device. If we go to the screen of the oscilloscope, you can see this. So the original channel number one in yellow color and only time domain. Now we have two screens. One is the quasi peak measurement. The other is the average measurement. And with the software, we have used the mask option of the oscilloscope to uh, create the limits. So we can identify if we pass or if we fail in our emissions. So with this product, actually I am failing in uh, conducted emissions. I am some dBs over the limits in some kind of uh, narrow band emissions that looks like they are very periodic uh, 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 from peak to peak. Uh, something interesting, we need to consider if the listen don't have this uh, accessory, let me go here. We need to consider to introduce some kind of protection for your EMI receiver. What I am going to introduce here is a transient protector. The transient protector usually is an, some kind of attenuator with some kind of diodes that clamp any kind of transient that can damage your device. So if we repeat the measurement, let's go to the uh, previous software. Look at this. The first peak is 70 dB microvolts. Now, if I repeat the measurement while I am introducing the transient protector, the 70 is going to 60. Why is this? Because if you go to the setup, this, the signal that is going out of the listen when passing through the transient limiter, including attenuator, is introducing here a 10 dB attenuation for the signals. So you need to know how is the frequency response of this accessory, of you introduce one amplifier, of you introduce a long cable, something like that. You need to know how is the, transient, the, 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 the frequency response of this accessory so you can correct in the measurements. So if I go to the software again, here you can see transducer factors. If I put here 10 dBs, that is the is, is basically constant in all this frequency range, in a, if, and I configure the oscilloscope, when I recover the traces, you see that the 60 is going to 70. That is the correct measurements. Be careful about that. And something that is important with oscilloscope is to use the input coupling with 50 ohms. Because look at this, the peaks are going down, going down, going down. But if I, by error, I configure the oscilloscope with one megohm, let's go to one megohm, that is typically typical in many oscilloscopes that they are not very uh, high in bandwidth. The idea is that configuring the oscilloscope and recovering the measurements, you will see, let's wait for a moment. Let's recover. You will see that they have the peaks going down. Up oh, is not very important here. Oh, let me let me do something. If not, I will repeat later. Ah, it's because I have the attenuator. Let me remove the attenuator. The attenuator is removing the reflections. So let's go here and let me repeat. Eh? Now I am going to put here again zero dBs in the in the transducer factor because I have removed it the attenuator, 
And let me put one megom, set up RTO. And now let me measure again. Let me measure again. Let me see if it works. Okay, you can see that the peaks are going down, but I have here some kind of a mountain increasing the amplitude. If I increase the length of the cable, if this cable, instead of uh, 20 centimeters, is, for example, one meter or two meters, this effect, this mountain effect, increase a lot. And this is because we are creating reflected signals in the transmission line. So remember, 50 ohms in the input impedance of the oscilloscope and introduce here the uh, transducer factor of the transient limiter or any other uh, element you can uh, be interested in introducing in the middle of the signal. So now I am not going to use the transient limiter in my experiment. So I set up the RTO with this configuration and because now it's 50 ohms, the input impedance, the reflections must be remove it. So let's go here to introduce FFT. Okay, so you see the reflections here are reduced. This is very important. If not, you will start to see uh, peaks that are not from your device, are peaks created by your setup. Well, so what can you do to reduce these emissions? What you can do basically is to review the design and to try to minimize this emission. The good strategy is not to uh, introduce a filter. The best strategy is to try to switch slower, considering efficiency, perhaps to introduce uh, a spread spectrum if possible. Perhaps you can uh, change the layout. Perhaps you can put the uh, aggressive elements far from the input connector of the cables. There is a lot of things to do before considering filtering, but at the end, in many, many products, you will need to introduce some kind of filter. And the important idea is that the filter be uh, as small and as cheap as possible, no? So let's try to see what happened if I introduce a filter. So now we return to my setup. And what I am going to do is to introduce this filter. Let me show you with the camera. Let's switch to the detail camera, only device here, transition. Okay, and here is my filter. Obviously, I, there is no time to explain the design of the filter. It's only for, um, for basic uh, demonstration. I have two capacitors. I have one common mode choke and two Y capacitors. I know that in this application, we, can, we don't say usually X and Y capacitors because there is no safety uh, rules like with the mains, but in this way, all the people is understanding. These X capacitors from positive to negative, and Y capacitor that goes to, from positive to chassis and from negative to chassis. Additionally, I have a common mode choke, but this common mode choke is being source circuited. So you can see here that with these jumpers, I am source circuiting the common mode choke. So now the common mode choke is not activated and the Y capacitors will not be working because I am not going to connect the Y capacitors to the metal plate. So if we introduce the a filter in place. Let me disconnect. Let me connect here uh, this way. And now we power again. Okay, we put here the setup. Let me change here. You can see that this is my filter. Okay. And uh, theoretically, I have now only X capacitors in parallel. So it's a filter with an order equal to one. Okay, so we go here to the uh, measurements. Let me go to the software of Roland Schwartz. So this is our actual measurement. Let me take a picture of this result. This is before the filter, and then we will be able to compare. And now let's recover again the measurements. So let's take here FFT, okay. Okay, so you can see that I am removing a lot of uh, emissions, but in some emissions I am failing. Instead of working with the filter uh, in some kind of trial and error, the recommendation is to work uh, with a 
trying to identify what is common mode and what is differential mode. You have the possibility to use an external uh, device that is called listen uh, mate or uh, is used is working with transformer resistors. There is different uh, methods to do that. But what I like to do many times is to work with the oscilloscope. So let me show you how is the uh, setup uh, of my instrument here. And what I'm going to do is to work with this uh, output going to channel number one. And now I remove the 50 ohms termination and I connect this to the channel number two. Let me press it the oscilloscope. And then when I press the oscilloscope, look at this, it's channel, uh, listen number one goes to channel number one. Listen number two goes to channel number two. And then what we see is this. Let me see what we see is this. This one, okay? So let's activate channel number two. Let's review that in channel number two, we have 50 ohms. And let me check that in channel number three, in channel number one, we have 50 ohms. It's very important to have 50 ohms in both channels. Okay, something like this. Uh, channel number two. I see. Channel number one. This is a mission in channel number one and in channel number two. Now, when you have the output of the two listens, listen one and listen two, if you add the two outputs, you will get two times the common mode emissions. If you subtract L1 minus L2, you will obtain uh, the uh, differential mode emission uh, multiplied by two or six dBs more. So what I, uh, what I am going to do is to go in a, the oscilloscope and I'm going to create a new function. It's in the math function. Let me go to here to the math function. I'm going to uh, work with the equation option. And then you can go here and to introduce channel number one. Let me remove all the... Oh, let me try to do this here. Here. Channel one plus channel two divided by two. Okay, why dividing by two? Is because I am uh, um, uh, trying to uh, calculate the common mode. Remember, addition means common mode. Subtraction means differential mode. So when we go here and we apply enter, we have math number one here. Let me remove the time domain signals. And now, Math number one is this. Let me increase the let me increase the intensity of the signal. Okay, something like this. And now we apply the FFT. We go here and we say from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, we can introduce a resolution bandwidth of nine kilohertz, and we apply this to math number one. And now in math number two, that is the FFT of the of this calculation, we can go to a scale, horizontal scale, and we can put this in horizontal scale in logarithmic way, okay? Something like this. So what you can see is that in my, in my measurements, this is the contribution of the uh, my emissions in the common mode. If we are interested in the differential mode, look at this. We can compare this. For example, let me save in reference. Reference. In reference one, I am going to save math number two. Update. Okay. So this is the common mode. Okay. Ah, sorry, sorry. I am going to repeat because I am measuring. Uh, let me show you. Transition. I am measuring with a filter. I need to make this measurement without a filter, okay? So now it's easy to solve the problem. So we are here again. 
and we update. This is the the uh, common mode. So let's update the reference. Update. Okay. So this is the common mode in the left side, and now opening the math, we can change the equation. Oh, sorry, not this one. We can change the equation to calculate the subtraction. Okay, instead of this, instead of adding the two channels, let me uh, back and minus. With the minus, I will be calculating the differential mode. And now it's okay, this one, okay? So you can see at what frequencies the dominant effect is differential mode and at what frequencies the dominant effect is common mode. And this is very important because then you can separate in, in a separated way to design the common mode filter, common mode chokes, Y capacitors, and the differential mode filter, X capacitors and differential mode chokes. Uh, sometimes common mode is not important and the dominant effect is the differential mode and the opposite. When you have this uh, work done, then you can go again to your software and then you can introduce the full filter. Okay, what I am going to do now is to connect the filter that in theory was designed considering these ideas. Uh, let me show you the, the camera so you can see what I am doing. No? Now the filter is in place. We go here, we see the setup and we measure with the filter in place. And we will see that we are not complying. Let me show you. Mm -mm. What happened? Wait a moment. It's not, con it's not working. Oops. Oops, oops. Let me, I am closing the, the software. Sorry, let me open again here. Oh, what? Sorry, it's because I have I have been working in parallel here about uh, so both here and then let me put the key the quasi peak limit the average limit then we set up the, here zero dBs set and then we repeat again set up RTO and we measure now is the emissions with the filter in place. And you can see that I am not, I will not be complying. Oh, sorry, it's failing, I don't know why. Oh, sorry, I forgot to make the B measurements. This one, quasi peak, sorry. I am trying to arrive on time. Uh, this one. I'm doing the setup. Let me introduce here zero dBs in the transducer factor because I am not introducing the transient limiter. And let me recover the FFT traces. FFT traces. Okay. Okay. And you can see that I am not complying, fully complying. And sometimes this is due to things like this. Let's go to the cameras and let's see what happened. No? Now, the connection of the Y capacitor is not done to the metal chassis, no? So I have this long wire. This is not a good strategy because this is inductive, but for the demo will be working. What you are going to see is how I connect directly with my finger to the chassis, the Y capacitors, no? So if we go to the software, let's go here, here, and let me activate the let me activate the continuous update. Now the software is updating every second, okay? So now the Y capacitors are not connected this way. Now I'm going to connect in this way. Chip, chip, okay? So let's go here and you can see here, this is not connected Y capacitors, Y capacitors connected. Oops, sorry, something is wrong here. Uh oh, effecto demo. Why is not filtering? I don't know why he's not filtering now. 
sorry. Well, anyway, uh, I don't know why it's not filtering because in theory, something I am doing wrong. Ah, okay, okay. It's because I, I discovered what happened here. The idea is that I forgot to uh, enable the common mode choke. Remember, the common mode choke is disabled with these jumpers. So now I am going to uh, remove the jumpers. So we can check here how is the result. You can see here that now I am better. In some peaks, I am touching the limit. I am not six dBs below the limits. And now is when I am going to touch with the uh, wire in the uh, chassis. Okay. So this is the emission here. This is what I am doing. The, remember, in my previous measurement, I forgot to remove the jumpers that were source circuiting the common mode choke. And that is because I, it was not failing for the common mode. No? So now we go here. This is without the capacitors touching the, plate, the metal plate. Now I am going to touch. Okay, so you can see now. Okay, so I am really, really below the limit. And it's a very, very useful technique to uh, identify if you need to change or to add components in common mode or in differential mode to check if something is well connected or not bad connected. Well, this is basically the idea of how to work with the oscilloscope. And now uh, let me show you something that is interesting. That is a good design. This is a technique that I like to show you from MPS. I will be working with this evaluation board. No? This is an evaluation board for a, a step-down converter uh, where they are applying some interesting techniques to minimize the emissions. That when you minimize the emissions at the design stage, you will have the possibility to reduce the size of the filters and you have a quiet element. No? The previous uh, DC-DC converter was created with the bat techniques considering the uh, size of the switching node, the distance between the components, the ringings, uh, etc. No? In this case, we have a four layers PCB and I will comment later some specific uh, ideas that are useful for this PC board. If we go to the setup or to the device uh, window, now you will see that my PC board, let me here, my PC board is now this one. Oops, sorry. This one, let me use a short cable to connect the power supply. I will use the same power supply like previously. This one and this one. Okay, I am introducing close to 20 volts. Eh? And in the output, I will be using a resistor, a power resistor. So I am able to put different load conditions to the converter, okay? So let me show you the resistor. It's here, and here you have the converter. And the converter now is working at full uh, range, and we are going to measure the emissions, okay? So you can see now in my software, this is the emissions of the product, okay? You can see here, look at the emissions. It's close to the zero level. Let me switch off the power supply. When I switch off the power supply, you will see the emissions from my product. It's something like this. This is with the power supply off. This is with the power supply on. Okay. So I would like to, to explain, I, I am interested in these uh, suggestions because for all of you interested in designing low impedance, low emission circuits, it's very important to understand some of these techniques. Uh, this is for a back converter, but you can understand this for any switching topology. Where is the most important or the two most important elements in a switching device? In a switching circuit, in a switching device, the most important things are the switching node, Remember is where you are creating harmonics and usually ringings. This is a high DVDT node. It's a strong electric field area and is connected to the inductor. So you can see here that if I take a look at this inductor, if you use a, a small inductor, 
This is much better than using a big inductor. If you use a big inductor, that means it's more metallic structure where you are applying this high DVDT. And you have more probabilities to extend the noise to nearby areas. Obviously, if the DC-DC converter is close to cables and connectors, this is the worst situation. And the second part that is very important is this one. If you consider here that this is the voltage, input voltage, and we try to draw a simplistic idea of the DC-DC converter, something like this, the switching node is here. And this is the ground. Let me draw in this situation. So you can see here these capacitors that are represented with this. So what happened with these capacitors? These capacitors have the function to give to the device all the transients we need to uh, work as expected. And this loop is really critical. This loop must be very, very, very small. And this is what you can find in this design. Look at this. Some You have these ideas in your, in your slides, but let me show you the top area of the PCB. In the top area of the PCB, you will find that the decoupling capacitors, the four decoupling capacitors, let me draw here, uh, let me reduce the size of the X. You will find two big capacitors, this one and this one, and later two smaller capacitors to work at higher frequencies, this one and this one. And you can see that one uh, symmetrically in this position to the input voltage. The input, the node for the input voltage is this one. Okay, this is the, the node for the input voltage. No? And you can see that one capacitor is connected here to ground and the other capacitor is connected here to ground. Why is this? This is because if you put the capacitors in this position, you put the capacitors symmetrically and the uh, ends of the capacitors are connected to ground and this is the V in voltage, the idea is that the current you, that you are injecting in the uh, device that is switching has opposite directions and the magnetic field is canceled. If you repeat this idea in the input for the four capacitors and in the output for the capacitors in the output circuit, you will have exactly the same idea. This is one of the most important things. The, another important thing is that the, in this setup, the a filter is close to the connector, to the input connector. This is the input connector that is in the bottom layer. If you put in the bottom layer, you will reduce a lot the possibilities of L1 and L2 of uh, uh, picking up noise. L1 and L2 are here. L1 and L2 are here. This is a filter. The filter we are using for our device is L1 and L2. No, so it's, it's a second order filter if we plot from the device under test. No, this is the device under test. This is the listen. No, if you use a fourth order filter, uh, you will get several advantages. The first one is that you will get uh, for each component, you have 20 dB per decade of attenuation. But additionally, the inductors will be a smaller in size. That means that they are less. They, they have less possibilities to pick up noise from the environment. And additionally, the size of the filter will be reduced and the filter is more effective. And additionally, look at this, the filter is in the bottom layer and the distance between the first stage and the second stage is some millimeters. They are not close one to the other because in this way we avoid the possibility of the two inductors are coupled. Believe me that in high frequency, this coupling is extremely critical. And look at the capacitors. The capacitors additionally are symmetrical. If you are interested in this kind of ideas, because we don't have time today for working in detail with this design, I recommend you to check the uh, application note and the documents you can find in the slides from MPS. Eh? MPS has a strong uh, experience in EMI and EMC. They have a very impressive EMC laboratory in, German, in Germany. And I had the opportunity to be there in, in, in two, two times. And, and really, uh, these kind of techniques um, can save a lot of money and a lot of problems in the future if you learn to apply them. The only question I need to explain is that they are using a ground plane 
with a slot. You can see here, this slot. So they have something like they can call dirty ground and we can have some kind of clean ground. So my recommendation for you is if you don't understand really what you are doing separating grounds, don't do that, okay? So really with this separation, they get something that is very, very, very clean. But believe me, if you don't know how to do that, don't separate grounds. Eh? But the other techniques are really important. The size of the components, the disposition in, in symmetry, symmetry, etc. No? So I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, 50, 55 minutes pass so fast that it's very, very difficult to comply with the, with the time. But thank you. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you, Arturo. Really good uh, demonstrations there. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that uh, we have our next session on the 14th, so same times as today. So I think most people registered for both, but if you haven't, go uh, go to the monolithicpower.com website and register again. Uh, Arturo, we do have a bunch of questions in already, so I don't know how you're doing for time, but we yes, can just start yes. jumping in. Let's, let's go. Uh, so the first one is one UF and AC film cap. You... Yes, you can have one uh, microfarad AC film cap. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is from early too. Is this is for DC? What about AC? The AC voltage is already reduced to a to applied to the measurement device. I am not sure I understand the question. Uh, for AC, it's exactly the same idea. The listen is a low pass filter. So you can pass uh, DC or you can pass 50, 60 Hertz. And the circuit is exactly the same. It's uh, basically it's an uh, CLC filter. So I am not uh, really uh, sure I understand the question, but it's, it's, it's basically the same idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, next to line up was, is it not necessary in some way to take into account the yes. frequency response? Yes, you are right. In the transducer factors, you need to introduce the listen factor as, as it was explaining to introduce the transient protector uh, factor. The idea is that with this listen, I have around one to three dBs in all the frequency range up to 300 megahertz. So I was not considering this was important, but you are right. You need to consider how is the frequency response. And usually the manufacturer, you check the, the listen from uh, Rod and Swart, they will give you a detailed uh, frequency response and you can introduce this in your measurement device. Thank you. Then they just want to know uh, what oscilloscope and bandwidth do you use? Well, my oscilloscope is now is RTO6. The bandwidth is two gigahertz, but you have seen that for this application, uh, you don't need to go to gigahertz, no? You can uh, go up to 500 megahertz, something like that. So consider how is the bandwidth you need, but if obviously you will be interested in radiated emissions, probably uh, to have one gigahertz or, or up to six gigahertz could be interesting. Thank you. Uh, is it a good recommendation to to use short cables from the from listen to EMI receiver. Yes, it's very very. Uh, it's a very good recommendation. Remember that this the length of these cables uh, must be as short as possible. Obviously, you can use long cables, no. But in theory, because long cable because cables are not ideal. If you use more long cable long cables, uh, probably you can uh, have the possibility to introduce more uh, artifacts. What I recommend is additionally to have short cable as much as possible. Perhaps you cannot work with this length. You will need longer cables. Uh, but uh, what is important is that the two cables must be exactly equal. Same manufacturer uh, from the same uh, time of manufacturing. So you are sure that the cables are symmetrical, the same characteristics, and especially if you are interested in adding and subtracting to calculate differential mode and common mode, because they need to have the same delay and the same attenuation in the in the two parts. And the next one was just about the name of the application software that you were using to draw the peak and quasi-peak limits. 
on the yes. oscilloscope screen. Yes, the application is called the, let me see how is exactly the, the name. The name is uh, RTX Precompliance. It's a software that came with the, with the Radar and Suar oscilloscopes. Uh, let me show you here, this one. Is EMI pre-compliance tool for Roden Suarez oscilloscopes. Uh, See, so you call to your uh, distributor of the of the oscilloscope for Roden Suarez. Probably we inform you. All right. It looks like the next one was the same same question. So we've already addressed that one. Uh, this one is asking, will a snubber help here? But I'm not sure. This was about a half an hour ago. I'm not sure where in the presentation that one got asked. Uh, well, the, the, the snubber here will not help, in my opinion. No, a snubber probably is a good option when you have uh, something that does uh, some kind of ringing. And if you want, if you are introduce uh, some snubber, you can reduce the ringing. But usually, the harmonics you are experimenting in some specific uh, frequency range are related with the square wave signal in the switching node voltage, no? The ringing usually, instead of this envelope, will create this mountain. And this mountain is what you probably will be able to solve with the snubbers, but not the amplitude of the harmonics. The amplitude of the harmonics must be reduced in other ways, reducing the switching times or increasing the switching time or with a, 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 with a spread spectrum, blah, blah, blah. Great. Uh, and then I think you had, what kind of filter is preferred? You had introduced a filter in. Uh, uh, the, usually when I am working with companies, uh, the filter they use is the filter that was working in the previous uh, uh, unit or the previous product. No? But in my opinion, the first thing to do is to separate common mode and differential mode. And then you try to solve the problems separately and then to combine. No? So in this way, you will be able to design the, the some kind of optimized filter. No, is it? It's not an easy topic, but it's very interesting because usually the filter in in power electronics today for I don't know for automotive can uh, cons can uh, represent 30, 40 percent of the size of the PC board. No, so to minimize the size of the filter can be very very important. Yep. Uh, next up, can you emphasize on the quasi peak and average measurements difference between the two and any best practice considerations we should follow? Well, quasi with quasi peak, uh, you have three basic detectors: the peak detector, the quasi peak detector, and the average measurements. The peak detector is looking for the um, peak of the signal of the peak of the EMI you are injecting. The average detector is uh, identify how is the average of this signal. And the quasi peak is some kind of uh, detection of how repetitive is the peak. So you can have a peak that is uh, uh, in some value, but is not repetitive or is happening every uh, a long time. No, So uh, a quasi peak uh, usually is a measurement that take more time. So for debugging, my recommendation is to use the peak detection. And if you pass in peak, you will pass in quasi-peak. That is the idea. And uh, the peak detection is additionally faster. So that is basically the idea. You have a lot of uh, uh, books, application notes, and references where you can learn uh, the schematics and the waveforms that you can obtain from these diff three different uh, detectors. Okay. Uh, any any different any different on listen configuration topology are required in case of DC DC or AC DC power supply implications for or applications for EMI measurement. Well, if you consider that the uh, main uh, the most basic circuit for the listen is something like this is one inductor with a capacitor here another capacitor here, and here you put the 50 ohms impedance of your oscilloscope, something like this. This is, for example, line neutral, positive or negative in your line, and this is the 
chassis, the metal plate. Yeah, in AC or in DC, this inductor is typically five microhenries. In AC, this inductor is 50 microhenries. And for DC, these, induct these capacitors are in hundreds of nano nanofarads, hundreds of nanofarads. And for AC, these capacitors are in microfarads. So basically what you are trying is to represent the, uh, um, the uh, impedance that was agreed uh, for the different applications. The impedance is different uh, in the inductance value because of the typical length of cables, no? And this is something that is trying to represent uh, the real world, but obviously is not able to match any circumstance. Something that is important in the AC uh, situation is that if you don't have a specific uh, ground system for your listen, you will need a isolation transformer because these microfarad capacitors will be connected from line to hertz and from neutral to hertz so you will have a lot of leakage current and you will uh, um, uh, fire the protection system of your installation. No? Uh, manufacturers solve this uh, circuit in different ways with very simple circuits like this one or with several stages of different inductors and capacitors in parallel, but with the same idea to, to offer a known impedance. Additionally, many of them introduce some kind of uh, transient protector. So they are able to protect your system from transients in, in, in while you are working, especially in power electronics or, or high inductive loads. Great, next up, uh, C4 and R5 appear to be snubber circuits. Do I need to place this on the same side as the IC? Okay, I suppose they, they, they are referring to this one. These are here. Okay, R5 and C4. Uh, uh, you can work with them for the EMI, uh, but be careful. Be careful because uh, the efficiency of the converter will be very related with the values of these components. Anyway, uh, as you say, these components must be exactly in the same layer of the uh, of the components of the IC. So usually, the switch, all the components connected to the switching node are not recommended to go through the layers because going through the layers can corrupt other uh, traces or other areas that are going uh, close to the vias no so yes put the components in the same place in the same uh, layer of the ic okay and then why did you say the inductors were placed at the bottom and this was kind of okay in the it's... same place in the presentation Yes, the, this is not mandatory. Eh? Uh, I have solved problems where the filter is in the same position, but consider, for example, that this is the filter. This is the filter we are designing. Okay, and this is my DCDC. So what happened in the DCDC? In the DCDC, you have additional inductors and you have loops created by the different components. So what happened if they are connected close one to the other. If you put the filter very close to the DC-DC converter, you can have uh, uh, signals being coupled to the inductor, especially if, they be, if the inductors are big. No? So if, you, if we put in the different layers, that means that between them, you will have a ground layer that is uh, sealed in. It's something like they are, uh, like when you are doing the layout of a PCB and you want to avoid crosstalk between traces, no? You have an aggressive signal and a sensitive signal. Uh, one of the strategies is to root the aggressive signal in the layer number one and the sensitive signal in layer number four, for example. No? In this way, uh, you have less crosstalk, less coupling. So this is the same idea. Other possibility could be shielding. No? You, you could shield the DC-DC converter to minimize the possibility to inject noise in the filter. Because if you inject noise in the inductors of the filter, this noise go out uh, bridging the, the, the filter. Great, thank you. Uh, outstanding presentation. I've just been dismissing these ones, Arturo, but lots of compliments in here too. Uh, thank you. Then what is the name of the evaluation board you were, you were showing? Okay, you have in the slides is this one, EVQ4431. Yep. Is and, that and evaluation? We'll, yep. 
We'll we'll send out the presentation uh, by the end of the yeah. week to everyone too, so yeah. you'll be able yeah. to to see that and just find it on our website. Yeah. Uh, can you briefly explain the difference between the dirty ground and the clean ground, or where to find but, info about it? Well, well, this is a topic that can uh, we need to talk about this um, a lot of time, no? But basically, consider that this is the IC in the top layer, and you have uh, some uh, trace that is the switching node, and you have some traces that are considering the ground for the power, no? And you have another trace that is for the input voltage, no? So this is connected in layer number one. Eh? So if you have uh, loops, you are creating loops in the first layer. I mean, uh, there is no, the retour path for the high activity currents is not in the second layer. It's in the same layer where you have the switching uh, layers, okay? And then in the lower layer, in the layer number two, you, you have a ground. So how is the idea? The idea is that the, the, the ground, this, gra this dirty ground, this, let's, let's write here dirty, this dirty ground is only in top layer, is working in some kind of area, in this area, and is connected to the second ground in the top layer in some specific vias, but, but not with multiple vias in any position. If you analyze the data sheet, you will see what I am trying to say, okay? You can see here, this is the, uh, the dirty ground, uh, I is not I am not able to see here clearly. Uh, my recommendation is to check to the data sheet. So one of the ideas to do this is basically that if in the top layer you have a, a current, aggressive current that is taking this loop in some way, you put in the lower layer a plane, you will create inducted currents in the second layer with a current that is opposite. That means what? The magnetic field at some specific point created by one of the currents is opposite to the other one. It's like it's like the same idea. You have a loop when you, where you have current and you put below this loop, you put a metal plate, the emissions at some specific points are eliminated because the current inducted in this plane cancel the magnetic field created by the first. So this is basically the idea, okay? Uh, the idea is to be able to have the high currents uh, circulating in the dirty ground in the top layer. Right? Anyway, if you don't, if you are not able to understand this, big, this well, this concept, uh, don't do that and uh, put the ground plane below the components of the IC and all the switching nodes and as close as possible. Okay, so in this way, multi-layer boards where the second layer is close to the first layer are better than two layers more where the distance between the first and the second layer is 1.6 millimeters or something like that. As close as possible is a good technique uh, and you will have a quiet uh, um, system. No? Okay. How critical is it for the filter damping factor from your experience? Oh, how, how critical is the, yeah, the filter Damping factor from your experience? I guess that is the question. Yeah, the, the idea is this. If you put a filter, and it's a low-pass filter for EMC in common mode or in differential mode, probably you are thinking in this. But uh, related with the terminal impedances and the parasitics in the components, perhaps you have this. And what happened with this? This is zero dBs. This is, I don't know, five dBs. That means that at this frequency, this frequency, uh, the voltage in the output will be higher than the input voltage. So for example, if you have a system with a switch, when you have here, I don't know, uh, let's say 12 volts, when you switch on, the voltage at the input of your system try to go from zero to 12 volts suddenly, okay? This is a step function. If you pass this step function, goes through this, under damped response, the output will go to this behavior. Okay, something like this. Sorry, something like this. It's 
So this is 12 volts. But this can be related with Q, Q times the input voltage. So you have a Q of 10. That means you can have 10 times the input voltage. So this is in my experience, no? Because uh, there are other probability to create problems. But in my experience, where I have seen this more important, it's in immunity test. When you apply immunity test, uh, this uh, underdamped situation can create in the output of the filter uh, transients very high, including in the situation where you have here a varistor. You have here a varistor, and perhaps the varistor is uh, clamping the input voltage, but because of this underdamped situation, uh, you can recover the voltage in the output of the filter. Great, thank you. Could we do the same DM and CM separation with two RF voltage probes instead of two listens, larger equipment? No, 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 because you you need to offer uh, to the product some specific impedance, and this is what we get with the line impedance stabilization networks. So uh, I think the answer is no. No, I think. Okay. Uh, let's see. The output capacitors from the MPS evaluation board are placed parallel, not 180 degrees as the inputs are. Is this all right for the emissions or is it best to place them also at 180 degrees? Ah, okay, okay. It's, the, it's different because here, let me see if I understand the question. Uh, let me see what is the slide. This is... Here, okay. The idea is that uh, for the input capacitors, the ground terminal is here. This is the ground terminal, and this is V in. Okay, but for the output capacitors, this is the inductance, and the two capacitors are located here. One of the things that you get with this situation is that the current that is trying to go out from your system and is able to pass through the inductor is returned in different phases to the uh, through the capacitors so this is the correct orientation and additionally the idea is that this capacitor and this capacitor close to the inductor create some kind of shielding of the inductor so the two capacitors close to the inductor create this shielding so uh, anyway if you put the inductor in this position let me think and you put the capacitors in this orientation, you will get some cancellation in the same way. So it's, it's correct, but you will not get the shielding effect of the capacitors with the inductor. So both situations can be good. I prefer the, 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 the one you have in the MPS board, but the other placement is correct too. Okay. Uh, can I use one listen box and do one conductor measurement at a time? Yes, you can. This is what you get when you buy a listen with a switch. Uh, it's a switch in the front panel. So you switch from line to miser line or to miser neutral or to miser positive and to miser negative. The only disadvantage is that you will not be able to, um, to uh, calculate differential mode and common mode. This is the... The only difference because they will not be synchronized and depending on your instrument perhaps you only have the spectrum and not the phase so you will not be able to add or subtract uh, as you talked about the coupling between the two magnetic components is it a big problem when i put yes. the input filter and the output filter close to each other yes yes it's very very important very very important typically it's not considered this the, the, the many designers that are not familiar with high frequency effects uh, don't uh, believe uh, this coupling until they see how important it is. Every, every time you have inductors, including uh, inductors with uh, uh, closed cores like uh, toroids, are uh, really good creators of magnetic field through leakage, or they can create, they can attract a magnetic field very easily. So it's impressive how you can destroy the efficiency of a filter or a system with this kind of location. Is The best option is to put the input and the output uh, one close to the other. If you see 
to my uh, to my camera, I will show you one idea related with this. Let me show you very quickly. This is one PCB. This is one PCB that is designed with the input voltage here and the output voltage here. So what happened? The, fil the output filter is, is here and the input filter is here. It's one close to the other. The difference in emissions is really impressive compared with this one. It's close to this to be the same. It's close to the same PCB. But the different one of the difference between them is that here the input voltage is here and the output yeah. voltage is here. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yes, sorry, sorry. I was going to interrupt you, but no, thank no, no, you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is this is the same. You can see here the the original board where you can see here the input voltage and the output voltage. So that means that the input and the output are one close to the other. You have the filter. Between these filters, they uh, up, uh, have a, a strong coupling. The only possibility is to introduce in the middle some kind of shielding no? or uh, some kind of orientation that minimize this coupling. This effect of coupling is increased if you use potting. If you use potting, the potting is usually a dielectric material of a constant uh, between three and six. So you will be increasing the capacitive coupling between the components in the input and the output. Another strategy is to do this. It's the same circuit, but what I am doing is to put the input voltage here and the output voltage here. So they are in separated areas. Okay? This can have uh, uh, problems in radiated emissions because with the cables here and here, you can create easily a dipole. But uh, considering all the risk and your system, where the connectors go, you can uh, solve many problems. But, but you know that sometimes solving conducted emissions, you destroy uh, radiated emissions. OK. Um... Is there a big difference between semi-shielded and full-shielded full inductors to reduce noise at the output? Or is it better to have a, a smaller size in the inductor? I, I prefer the small size inductor, but obviously a fully shielded inductor is better for EMI. OK, but the, where do you put the, the inductor and how is the orientation and how is the size is uh, really important. And additionally, in another comment I was saying uh, um, in a previous uh, comment, let me show you this screen, the, uh, you will see that in many inductors, the manufacturers put a dot. That means that like the inductor has polarity. No? That is because if you look at the inductor and this is the core, the dot explain where is the origin of the winding, okay? so. Here is the winding, several turns, and this is the starting uh, point. So if you connect this to the starting point. Let me show you here. This is the switching node, and this is the output. Okay? Consider, for example, that you are working with the DC-DC converter. No, so I'm hey, sorry. This is a diode, something like a diode here. Okay, so this is the switching node. If you if you have the switching node here. The advantage of the dot point connected to the uh, transistor uh, switching node is that the internal part of the inductor is the uh, node that is uh, experimenting the DVD-T. So this, this winding here, the external winding is creating some kind of shielding because the external uh, winding is connected to a constant voltage that is V out. You don't have DVD-T. That is because it's additionally, if you are measuring uh, with, a, for example, a, um, how to say, a Rugowski coil, if you are interested in the current in the inductor, it's better to put a, the uh, Rugowski coil here. Here is the Rugowski coil. Here is the Rugowski coil. This is not good. This is good. Why? Because here you have a strong DVD-T, and here the DVD-T is zero. So uh, Rugowski coils are very, very sensitive to DVD-T. So, so these kind of things, small inductors, and considering this kind of uh, techniques from manufacturers are very, very useful. Great. And then another, I think this is a duct inductors as well. The end of the winding to the least noisy point. Not a lot of detail in that one. Yeah, that is. Uh, 
Can you point out the schematic, the capacity? The schematic, the capacitor, which was added at the end to reduce the measured noise of the first circuit. Ah, okay, I suppose that uh, he's saying this one. He's it's near the end of the presentation. Uh, but uh, I suppose that he says about this, no? This, this capacitor, I, see, I suppose. So very, no? With this capacitor, I was able to reduce the noise a lot. Yeah. I, I am I am not sure if this he's referring to this one. Anyway, uh let's try to go in this idea. And this is my filter. My filter is an X capacitor, it's a common mode choke, it's another X capacitor, and then I have two Y capacitors. One is here and the other is here. So these capacitors were connected with a wire. So if I don't connect this to ground, the white capacitors are doing nothing. Okay. This is 4.7 nanofarad capacitors. I think is is what they, he is asking. Okay. Great. If Thank nothing, you. Let me know. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it better to use a ferrite bead instead of an inductor? No, it's different. It's different. Remember that when you are when I don't know exactly where you uh, refer to use a ferrite bead instead of one inductor. Obviously, in the output of the back converter, it's impossible because you need uh, to storage energy and you need one inductor. No, And if you are considering some kind of filtering, uh, this is the same idea. Remember, with one inductor, you have, um, in theory, it's like you have ohms related with omega L. There is no dissipation. Obviously, you have a small resistance that is related with the copper or uh, losses in the in the core or something like that. But the important thing is that you are interested in micro Henry's or in Miley Henry's, something like that. But when you are working with ferrite, the idea is that you are working with something. The impedance of this inductor is something like this until you arrive to the resonant frequency. But with ferrite, the impedance is doing something like this. And what you are interested in is in the area where the uh, ferrite is resistive. Uh, not in the area where the ferrite is inductive. This effect is totally inductive, a, a reactive, this inductive, no? So when we select a ferrite for EMI purposes, usually we are interested in uh, selecting a frequency, the frequency where we have the problem to introduce losses. So the EMI, uh, let's say, disappear, is converted to heat. But when we are using inductors for filtering, the noise don't disappear. The noise is reflected to the source. Perhaps can do some problems or not. So it uh, depends on the application. Okay. Uh, and I do, we have knocked off a lot of questions, Arturo, and, and our list is getting longer. Uh, we still have a list of 25 and we're gonna have to cut this off uh, at the top of the hour so. I apologize to everyone. Um, you know, we'll have a discussion with the panelists and and see what we might be able to do to uh, address all these questions. Great, great stuff that you've been going through. Let's try and knock out a couple more, but I think we are we are going to have to call it good at the top of the hour. Um, what is the main reason to place the input filter on the opposite side of the power supply at the second board? Yes, this is what I answered before, is that uh, in this way, you minimize the coupling, the parasitic coupling between the DC-DC converter and the uh, output filter. So the output filter is not detecting magnetic field, basically magnetic field coming from the DC-DC converter. It's some kind of shielding. You are using the, the inner layers to separate both areas. Could the same method be used to separate differential and common noise using a donut? Uh, I suppose, I don't know what is a donut because donut for me is something very sweet, but uh, I suppose that the, it's referring to some kind of transformer uh, to uh, add or subtract the output of the two listens. Uh, if this is the equation, yes. Ah, I see just... further down, they clarified like a, a prime current. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, we will send out 
a recording of all of this. Ah, uh, the donut is a proof uh, current. Yes, you can do something, but not easy. Because when you are measuring in a cable, differential mode and common mode, the measurements are very, very uh, affected by the position of the current probe in the cable. So be careful about that. But you can do things with 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 a current probe. Uh, in the case of an AC-DC converter, when the heat, heat sink needs to connect to somewhere to avoid the EMI, so where should it be connected? Uh, considering that the uh, heat sink is working with uh, power devices, uh, the, the general answer to this question would be to the uh, power ground. So the uh, activity that you are injecting from the device to the heat sink is returned to the ground of the power system. But obviously, you can have some problems, for example, with uh, uh, safety or, for example, with uh, uh, immunity test. And then you need to apply other solutions, no? But the idea is to put the head sinks at a constant voltage so he's not, float, he's not floating, he's not experimenting DVDs. Should I put some elements or trace below the inductor or the transformer? No, never. Below the transformer or the inductor, uh, the best option is to put ground plane as close as possible. Yes, you can change the value of the inductance and you can introduce some losses, but in my experience, this is not a very big effect and it's more important to contain the energy in the area of the inductor, not spreading the energy around the, the system. Uh, remember that uh, in AMI, uh, answers must, uh, the best answer is it depends, but let me say never. Great. And sorry, but I think this is going to have to be the last question. Um, is it possible to characterize common mode and differential mode noise with a current probe? Yes, yes, yes. You can do that. It's, it's, the, it's the same idea like previously, but the idea is if you have, a, you have two wires, something like this, and you want to measure the common mode, you do this. So you will get common mode. And for the differential mode, you do this. Let me draw here. You take the current probe, you put in this area, and then the element goes in this direction. Yep. So the output of this current probe is two times dm. This is the correct way. But what I was explaining is that depending of where is the current probe located, is here or here or here, the measurements can change a lot because there is a transmission line and you have a reflecting waves and you can have maximums, minimums, zeros. So you need to put the cables very, very uh, fixed in position. Okay. And I think we're going to have to call it good at that point. And thank you, Arturo. You stayed with us in okay. a half hour extra long and lots of great answers, but we really appreciate your input. For those of you whose questions we didn't get to, I apologize. Remember, we're going to be back next week. So maybe we can get to some of this then. But um, appreciate all the interaction and input that everyone was able to provide today. OK, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation uh, to MPS and Rodensoir to be here with all of you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye now. Bye.